Uh, good afternoon, I'm Council Member Jim Graham, Chairperson of the Committee on Human Services. The time is now, oh, let's say 3.45 on Wednesday, May 7th, 2014. We are here in room 123 of the historic John A. Wilson Building at 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, for the continuation of the oversight hearing on the mayor's proposed two, FY 2015 budget for the Department of Human Services. Now that hearing was held on April the 30th. Um, and at the prior hearing, we held from all the public witnesses, which I think totaled, if I'm not mistaken, 81 public witnesses. So at the conclusion of that, we determined that we would recess the hearing so that we could return refreshed and energized and ready to deal with these complex and challenging issues. So, uh, we're here to hear the testimony of the Director of the Department of Human Services. Director Burns. Good afternoon, uh, I'm Chairman Graham. I'm joined by Deborah Carroll. She's the Administrator of the Economic Security Administration. Uh, Michelle Williams, who's the Director or the Administrator of the Family Services uh, Administration and Hayden Bernard, who is our Chief Fiscal Officer. Uh, and uh, they, they do not have individualized testimony, but they're here to answer uh, some of the more in-depth technical kinds of questions in each of their areas. Um, I'm David Burns, uh, the Director of the Department of Human Services, and I'm pleased to t testify before you today on the proposed fiscal year uh, FY 2015 budget for DHS, uh, which fully addresses the agency's funding needs. To support the continued growth of the District of Columbia, Mayor Gray's uh, FY 2015 budget submission focuses on four priorities. Uh, continued improvements in public education, additional investments in affordable housing, encourage economic and workforce development, and improve the quality of life for all. Within the Health and Human Services cluster under Deputy Mayor B.B. Otero, we have crafted our approaches and our budgets in ways that keep families at the center of our attention. Our families are served and thrive through a connected fabric of personal, private, and public systems. And our work is driven by the goal of strengthening families and communities to reduce the need for intrusive, high-cost interventions. The DHS budget is comprised of general funds, federal grants and payments, interdistrict funds, and a small amount of special purpose revenue O-type funds. The aggregate budget amount proposed for FY15 is $408 million, uh, in which is an increase of $16.4 million, or 4.2% more than the approved uh, fiscal year 14 budget. And the number of FTEs proposed for 2015 is uh, 951. The uh, homeless services budget is uh, one of the major components uh, of what we do. And in uh, 2014, the mayor requested $107.9 million for homeless services. In the course of the year, the mayor and the council increased our base budget to a total of $111 million. Uh, point nine, uh, $111.9 million to meet the increased need for our homeless population. For 2015, the mayor is requesting an additional uh, $3.9 million over 14 uh, base to a total of $115.8 uh, million. This additional funding reflects key investments to prevent homelessness and to enhance the continuum of care including an increase in rapid rehousing for individuals and families, an increase in the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERAP, and the additional funding needed to end homelessness for chronically homeless veterans in the district by the end of 2015. But even this significant increase in funds will not be sufficient to meet the needs of our homeless residents especially the increasing number of homeless families, unless we follow through on the comprehensive system changes currently underway. As I have stated so many times, the solution to homelessness is not shelter, it is housing. 
Shelter is at best a temporary response necessary in emergency situations and used only until the individual or family can move into stable housing. With the cost of keeping a family in a hotel or at DC General now exceeding $150 per day, the mayor's budget is predicated on implementing permanent alternatives to shelter and in reinvesting the savings into housing and other long-term solutions. Before I describe the reinvestment solutions, it may be useful to recap some of the circumstances that led to the surge in our homeless family population this year and their resulting effect on our current budget. As I testified before this committee on February 3rd, 2014, the Interagency Council on Homelessness's uh, winter plan projected a need to place 509 families into shelter during this hypothermia season. We were all very optimistic that that was a, very, a high number uh, that we would live within that predicated on the reductions that we had seen the uh, previous year. And this was at least a 10% increase over last year's placements. But by the end of January, we had already placed over 700 families. We exhausted all of the uh, available hotels in DC willing to take our families into long-term placement and began to place families into hotels in Maryland. And when objections were raised to the Elna State placements, it was discovered that DHS lacked the legal authority to continue placements into Maryland. And I will say, in addition to my testimony from uh, when I was here a month ago, I am no longer breaking the law. <laughs> we have returned all of those families uh, as quickly as what we possibly could, but uh, uh, we have now uh, returned all of our families to, uh, to the district. And this enormous increase in hotel placements quickly exhausted all funds available for hotel uh, for hotels, resulting in the need to reprogram additional funds to meet these needs. These additional funds are not part of our base budget for 2015, but we firmly believe that the expansion of shelter or the use of hotels in 2015 is a poor outcome for families and a poor investment for the city, uh, and the budget and our plan is predicated, again, on the longer-term housing solutions. So instead, we are making the investments to move families currently in shelter and hotels back into housing in the community. And with the help and guidance from the community and our partners and advocates and providers and certainly from uh, you, Chairman Graham, and uh, other members of the council, the mayor has launched a project to move 500 families out of hotels and out of D.C. General in 100 days starting on April 1st, uh, 2014. And although the, this effort began well over a year ago, this current initiative focuses on recruiting at least 500 new apartments to be available for our clients th that will receive rapid rehousing assistance. We are uh, enhancing our inspections, uh, have new resources uh, devoted so that the uh, apartments can be approved more quickly, uh, providing landlord support so they find that this is a uh, uh, a more beneficial program in which for the landlords to participate. We've increased staffing and processes to uh, meet our goals uh, by July 9th, 2014. Uh, and uh, we have uh, had a good response so far with over 200 potential units already offered and undergoing review and inspection. On March 31st, when I first drafted this uh, testimony, uh, uh, the total number of families in hotels and at D.C. General was 662. By uh, July 9th of 2014, there will be no more than 162, or that's the, uh, the 500 reduction. But as of today, uh, looking at, or as of yesterday, looking at the census count for yesterday, uh, we've had a reduction of 86 families so far in the first uh, 37 days of the project. Uh, and uh, given that this is the startup period, we're uh, quite happy with that, but we have a long ways to go and are uh, pushing for close to a total of 200 uh, 
uh, in May in order to uh, to uh, get these families moving into the housing. In conjunction with this effort, the mayor recognizes that families need support and guidance from the whole community and not just from the government agencies to successfully maintain and thrive in their new homes. Uh, we know, and you've asked many questions, uh, Chairman, about um, how we're going to make sure that these families aren't out on the street at the end of the, their rapid rehousing subsidies. To provide additional support uh, for our families, the mayor has reached out to the faith community and initiated a new program called One Congregation, One Family, based on a similar project currently operation, operational in Colorado, and I might say uh, highly successful uh, just as, a, uh, as an aside, I took a small uh, team to see the programs in Denver and in uh, Colorado Springs uh, just this last weekend, uh, members of our faith community and a couple of the key staff people in my office so that people could really get the sense of what's going on. It was an extremely powerful experience for all of us, especially hearing directly from the families that have been served and uh, how having this additional resource in their lives is actually just what they needed in order to that they were uh, the clients are getting jobs they're uh, getting involved uh, uh, one married couple both have uh, been clean and sober in uh, in their substance abuse treatment something they had struggled with for years but this they attribute their success to uh, having this additional support um, the government uh, under this program, both what they're doing in other locations and what we'll be doing, um, we will c continue to pay for services uh, and the financial support and the case management that families need. But the churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places of worship will provide the opportunity for their members to become extended families, uh, often lacking uh, for those who've grown up in poverty. And the model is based on the development and fostering of relationships. In a government model, one staff member is assigned to a, a number of struggling families. And this is called a caseload, of course. It's efficient, but not a very good way of instilling hope, faith, and friendship. Often volunteer mentoring programs assign one volunteer to uh, uh, one or more uh, individuals or families. This can be useful, but often insufficient. The proposed model is based on the belief that it takes a village not only to raise a child, but even more so to support the family. The Church of Faith group becomes the community and a team of volunteers from the faith group becomes the extended family. The teams uh, are diverse with uh, multiple assets, skills, and interests. Uh, every team has uh, one and usually several real good moms. Teams may also include, include people who can fix things. Uh, and I met with a team who went in and painted uh, together. The whole team painted the client's basement, and you know, uh, you don't get those kinds of things in, in government approaches. Uh, so uh, uh, the, we're uh, just very uh, pleased and happy that this is part of the model. It's just a, an example that I'm going into uh, uh, in, in more depth because uh, it's unique and uh, and it's just an addendum and a part of the 500 families uh, effort. Um, with the combination of these approaches, we expect to, to begin the next hypothermia season with a population at DC General well, uh, well below 100 families. And with full success this summer, we will begin to admit new families who have exhausted all other alternatives. And I know you mentioned uh, at the, uh, the hearing on May 3rd uh, what seemed to be a contradiction between what I was saying and what the mayor was saying. Uh, it really isn't a, a contradiction. Uh, we cannot and will not be able to uh, admit uh, families into D.C. general until we get the population uh, down uh, so that we have a, a good capacity uh, to start the season. But once we get down to that critical mass, uh, we will be able to move them in, but not for long-term placements. We don't want these families to be there for another year or more like so many of our clients are uh, and have been now. 
but rather to uh, uh, get them out in 30 days, certainly no more than 60 days, uh, using the rapid rehousing uh, model and being able to turn our approach into not a hypothermia approach uh, exclusively, but rather uh, a year-round support services for families. Just as I was saying in the previous uh, uh, hearing, we don't want to uh, protect kids just during hypothermia season. We don't want to just protect families during hypothermia season. Actually, we, we've always had the capacity for uh, the adult population year-round, uh, year but we need these systemic changes and approaches so that we can do the same thing for uh, children and families. But uh, that requires, again, that investment in uh, housing as the uh, the primary option rather than an ever-expanding shelter system uh, and approach. Uh, in the uh, now, one of the big points that you have made uh, several times, and one that is just near and dear to my ears, is the closure of of the dead building. Uh, D.C. General, uh, and uh, I wouldn't said it was dead if uh, I didn't want it buried. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and I'm s simply speaking the words that I know uh, is uh, the the mayor's preference, everybody's preference. But we we want and need this to be done in a very thoughtful and planned approach because, uh, as you have said, and in all of the advocates have been afraid just a, a premature closing of that facility uh, without proper alternatives would be worse than, you know, the, uh, the treatment's worse than, uh, than the cure that you get for it. So we really uh, need to have it in a planful way. Uh, the mayor has identified approximately a half million dollars in this current capital budget. Uh, not in the operating budget, but in the capital budget, and that's in the D DGS uh, budget, not in the DHS budget, to be used for planning the replacement of the uh, D.C. General uh, facility entirely. Again, I know this is your goal, and uh, I, I'm meeting with uh, Brian Hanlon, the director of DGS, and the deputy mayor for us to uh, kick off this planning. I think what's the uh, what? Uh, how do we plan the plan? Uh, uh, how, uh, how are we going to get the uh, people together? What's the scope of the planning? And that discussion will start tomorrow. Uh, and uh, uh, I have said in my uh, previous testimonies to you, uh, I think a couple of 50 bed shelters with some uh, uh, winter capacity beyond that combined with the rapid rehousing and the way to get families through uh, would be sufficient capacity, uh, but we have to make sure that, uh, that we're putting all of the other pieces in place uh, to make that possible. And then we have to look at the plan. Where do we put those uh, facilities? Where do we, uh, uh, what's the style of the rooms that we want? You know, we only want to do this once. Uh, you know, it should be a long-term investment. So. Uh, we're, we're looking at all of those criteria. How do we get the community buy-in for this type of facility and get uh, out of the NIMBY uh, of, uh, so that uh, we can spread uh, uh, the, the wealth and the, uh, the benefit of having the diversity of our uh, 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 residents uh, throughout the entire community. Um, with that, I'll, I'll switch over to the Economic Security Administration. Uh, we're, uh, we've got some new and exciting and expanded new activities in the ESA area. Uh, this unit, of course, determines eligibility for benefits under uh, temporary assistance for needy families, or TANF, for medical assistance, for supplemental nutrition assistance programs, SNAP, whereas us old guys uh, still call food stamps, uh, child care, burial assistance, and interim disability uh, assistance. And uh, despite a reduction of $5 million in cash benefits uh, due to phase in in the 60-month time limit, the overall budget for ESA is proposed to increase by over $10.5 million 
so the expansion in other services and supports beyond that uh, uh, reduction for the time limits is uh, over 15 uh, million dollars and the largest enhancement that we will have in the TANF uh, program or in the ESA is for the job opportunities and training uh, portion of TANF. Uh, that's the, uh, the groups that uh, engage our clients and help them get jobs and training in order to be economic sufficient. Uh, the mayor has also proposed an increase of $7.1 million to expand the TEP contracts and to further the support of employment and training successes of the recipients. The uh, next largest increase is for eligibility determination services. As you know, our clients face long lines and lengthy waits for customers to apply or renew their benefits. Uh, this is not uh, the way that uh, I like doing business and certainly not uh, uh, the best approach for uh, serving our citizens. So uh, uh, we are and, uh, investing in staff, in automation, in other approaches to uh, improve the systemic approaches and the ways that we can get people in and out more quickly and get them the help they need uh, much more quickly. We have a, a, a variety of other initiatives to improve the efficiency and to reduce the wait times. I'm particularly excited about the new computer system funded at 90 percent federal uh, funding. Uh, I, I like picking their pockets, actually, uh, especially when it's for something that's so vitally important for our residents. And uh, when under the Affordable Care Act, when they uh, uh, offered uh, a system not only to uh, develop the computer software and approaches for the health care exchange and the insurance, they said that we could also use the same 90-10 money to uh, replace our uh, old legacy system, the, uh, the old ACEDS uh, system, and, uh, uh, and uh, get much better approaches and efficiencies under that old 20-year-old, uh, now outdated legacy system. The total federal funding for the computer system exceeds over $100 million, uh, and including the portion, uh, of course, for the, uh, the health exchange, but uh, at least half of that will go for our interoperability so because it's not just eligibility we'll be able to have integrated case management you know, you're always asking questions and uh, and dissatisfied with our time and response in answering your questions this will give us a chance to be able to respond much more thoroughly and completely about what's going on with our clients and how to serve them better uh, in order to uh, better assist our clients to find jobs, DHS needs additional case managers. Now that all of our families have been assessed and have developed individual responsibility plans, DHS must follow through with our promise and our responsibility to help each family to be successful. As a result, the mayor has proposed an additional $2.6 million for case management services uh, primarily within DHS so that we can uh, uh, meet these needs even for clients who uh, aren't appropriate for or ready to go into our contracted services and, uh, and vendors. Uh, the mayor uh, would like to publicly thank you, Council Member uh, Graham and especially uh, also Council Member Barry and I know that there were others that were involved but we know your visibility and your leadership on uh, and advocacy to uh, provide a cost of living increase for TANF recipients. Uh, as you know, our families have not had a general increase in benefits since 1996. The uh, purchasing power of their grants has significantly diminished in the last 18 years. And to begin to address this issue, the mayor has proposed a 2.4% increase for this next two years, 2.4% uh, each of the next two years, with a whopping 46% increase in 2017. And this would bring our benefit level comparable to the benefits currently uh, paid uh, in Maryland, and it's also roughly equal to uh, the loss in buying power as measured by the computer uh, or the consumer price index since 1996. 
the mayor proposes that the uh, that in 2018 and beyond that the TANF benefits automatically be adjusted to the CPI uh, for the long-term financial plan uh, so that we don't have to just come back each year and have a debate about that. The mayor proposes an additional $2 million for substance abuse and mental health treatment. Uh, the budget also has an additional $210,000 in uh, uh, for the domestic violence programs, and uh, both of these are vital for the health and safety of our families. Another small but vital component of the Economic Security Administration is the uh, IDA. The uh, FY 2014 budget is... Uh, uh, $3.04 million. This is money for those uh, individuals that are applying for Social Security or for SSI disability kinds of benefits and uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it, it's not a lot of money but uh, for those that get it, it's their, their lifeline uh, and so uh, we're now able to serve in this year about a thousand customers and there currently is no waiting list. But for 2015, the mayor knows that uh, this is going to be a continuing demand and issue. So he's uh, proposed to increase that by a half million dollars, increasing our ability to serve about uh, 1,350 customers through the IDA. And for many single adults, this is their only lifeline until they start receiving those federal benefits. I know you have many questions and uh, many other issues that uh, me and my team are very anxious to uh, address. So uh, uh, we know that there's significant resources provided in the 2015 budget. Uh, we're changing how we do business to better serve uh, families and individuals and move them from dependency to independence and from poverty to uh, greater financial stability. But with this, uh, uh, I'll conclude my formal testimony and uh, welcome any further question, guidance, or uh, uh, issues that uh, you'd like to bring forward. Thank you very much, Director Burns. And let me begin with a commendation of you and your staff and, and the mayor and, and his people so that uh, there's no question, but we have an absolutely first-class team of people working on these issues. And we have to be very clear about that because... Well, we have disagreements, they're disagreements with, of a very respectful kind. And I don't doubt your motivation, I don't doubt your ability. In fact, I have great respect for all of you in terms of what you bring to the table. So let me be very clear about that. And I certainly think the mayor of the District of Columbia is our number one human welfare advocate. You know, and there's no issue about that in my mind. Um, we do have uh, some, a large area of agreement. We have some very good things in this budget. Uh, I do appreciate the, uh, the cost of living for TANF being incorporated in the budget. I'm thinking about moving the automatic adjustment from 18 to 16, from 2018 to 2016, but, you know, that is, provides relief a little bit quicker uh, and without substantial immediate cost. Uh, and, and I'm pleased also about the, the expansion of programs for, for IDA and, and, and ERAP and, and so on rapid rehousing. Uh, I, I think that where we have to struggle with each other is over TANF and over DC General and possibly over CCNB. And those are, those are the areas that I'd like to focus in on today, uh, although there's a number of other questions that we probably will ask depending upon our endurance abilities. Depending upon my endurance ability, <laughs> my endurance abilities are unquestioned. No, no, not anymore. First, let me start with the simplest of questions. Uh, did you have a surplus in FY13? Did the DHS have a surplus in there? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bernard, what, can you give us the details of what it was? And, uh, I'm talking principally about local funding. Make sure you have your microphone is on. Will it be right? Yes, sir. Um, yes, we did have a surplus. It was maybe about $2.9 million, and um, almost 95% of that was due to fixed costs returned from DGS. And tell, uh, how, how do you understand what the fixed costs are? Um, the fixed cost is the funding the um, DGS takes from the agencies for rent, 
utilities, uh, telecom. So they didn't take as much? They, actually, they gave us an assessment, but at the end of the day, the assessment was a bit higher than what we actually spent. So that $2.9 million would have gone to the budget, the bottom line? And the budget. It went to the bottom line. Okay. Um, what happened to DC General? Because DC General found a shelter. Uh, I, I, and I, and I, I think that what I have to say right off the bat that I'm pleased with the progress that there is money being set aside for planning the complete closure of the building. And I think we have a respectful disagreement here over what to do. And I'm not with the advocates tomorrow, and hopefully DHS is included. You're, inclu you're included. You should be included. You are included. I want you to be included. I want you to come. I want you to bring whomever you wish from the rest of the uh, leadership at, in the mayor's office. Uh, we want to have a, because we're very little time, you know. Now we're, we're a week away from filing our report uh, and, and circulating, excuse me, circulating our report to the, all the members of the committee. And, and this is a key issue that we've, we'll do our best to try to figure out. Um, what you present to us is an option which is, which is uh, respectable and, and, and possibly very valid, which is that we, we proceed with the reduction in families moving them out of hotels and out of D.C. General as chartered by the mayor, and that by July 15th, I think is the latest date, maybe I'm wrong, there will be 500 families out of hotels and D.C. General. You have informed us today that that would leave about 162 at D.C. General on July the 15th, or give or take a few days. Um, interesting, I think that's the first day of our recess, so, you know, we get to, we, we don't really get to look at this too closely, but I might, I might actually schedule a hearing of this committee around about the 11th of July to see where we are in all of this. Um, but you know, the, the proposal from uh, the, the strategy from the mayor would, would you'd make a huge dent in the number of people today who are in hotels and in D.C. General. But D.C. General would continue to exist. D.C. General would continue to have a uh, residence, 162 in July. And D.C. General would still be there. And my, hopefully you'll see mine as a respectable point of view that once we hit hypothermia season, uh, there'll be enormous pressures on the D.C. government. I'll still be here. You'll probably still be here uh, to fill up some of the vacancies because people are going to be coming in and even if some, some are, are moved away into their own apartments, whatever, uh, there's, there'll, there'll be more of comers and they'll want a place for emergency shelter. And there's D.C. General sitting with a current capacity of 280 families. Uh, the possibility of additional overflow, which is probably now illegal under court rulings. Um, and I just think that there will be, be a tendency, which will be easy to understand, to, to add more people to D.C. General. And before you know it, it will be January the 2nd, there will be a new government. I'm gone. Um, you might stay, I hope you do if you want to. The rest of you may stay, I hope you do if you want to. But there'll be a huge difference. There'll be a whole new administration, um, and there'll be cold days, and there'll be children living in, in bus shelters and Union Station and stairwells and couch surfing and all the things that we, we, we know so well. Uh, if, if, and so that's going to happen all over again. That's my fear. And I think the way we overcome that is to, number one, uh, begin right now to figure out quality housing. I agree with you. Uh, sh uh, homelessness should not be solved by shelter, it should be served, solved by housing. And you've made that point many times, I got, I got the message. But we should begin now by creating a, a, an alternative to D.C. General that can take more capacity, an alternative in terms of emergency shelter other than D.C. General, uh, and, and, and determine and commit to ourselves and to the public that we want to shut this thing down at the end of the year. I think absent, I'm, going to, I'm coming to my question, but absent that resolve, absent that, you know, and I don't want to, there's been a suggestion, which I think is just absurd, that I'm, that I'm thinking about closing D.C. General and we will we not need any plan in place, we won't worry about, and you know, obviously not. But on the assumption that we can put that plan into place and that we have money sufficient to do that, then to have the world to shut this down and say it's going to come to an end 
You know, we have a bad habit. When you have something awful happening in your life, I determine to say, okay, that's enough. We're going to stop. Is, is really the answer. And I, I feel that if we don't do that, and again, I won't be here so on January the 2nd. And so if it's still open, well, I'll be able to say, I told you so. If there's now going to be 250, 300 families there, and we're back to the status quo, then I have that right to tell you that. But I think we can plan it now. We have time to move away from this building. Because I think you and I agree, uh, uh, Director Burns, that a shelter of this size, with this many children, and this many human situations, and this many vulnerable people, and, and families in crisis and everything else just doesn't work by definition. And I, I know it doesn't work for 280 families. I doubt if it's going to work for 162. And uh, so, your point of view is, is valid and, and respectful. I, I, I don't have any question about how thoughtful it is. But I think mine is as well. And I feel that we're going to go right back down that slippery slope if we don't determine to shut it. Shutter it. And with, with good options available. Now, what, what, what do you say in response to that little speech I've just made? I hope we're both right, uh, that uh, uh, we will be successful in providing uh, uh, rapid rehousing, that the uh, population will be drastically reduced down to 50, 75 uh, 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 at the beginning of hypothermia season, that we never get over 150. Uh, uh, the next uh, winter because we're getting people continued to be placed into housing. Uh, and I would love to think that we could find an alternative within the next eight months to D.C. General. Uh, I guess I'm just on that, that realistic curve of what is, I, I haven't heard what that, uh, uh, that alternative is. Uh, if we had a better idea of what we meant, I don't think the mayor uh, would support the alternative being hotels. Right, uh, but if we don't begin to explore this. Well, uh, I think we are. I mean, what, what would the, suggest you, Mr. Director, again, with your vast experience with all of this, what would you suggest to you that we could manage 162 families in a single well, facility? I said, well, we'll be down to that number. That's at the end of the 500 families. Uh, right. Another month later than that, we would be down under 100. and. A month after that, uh, probably down to around 50, and we'd be admitting new people in uh, and keeping the population uh, down low when, so that when we started the, the season, even though we had continued to place families for the remainder of this fiscal year, uh, that uh, we uh, 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 would be starting the season, maybe 50, 75 people in, uh, in D.C. general, and uh, uh, have capacity for those that uh, continue to come in, be moving them out, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's uh, then we can demonstrate that if we're going to make new construction or renovations mm -hmm. in existing buildings and all, this indeed is what we need to plan for. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, the, the, the pro there are several problems with that. I mean, number one, if you have, say you only have 50 families, and we get into a cold spell, a, a wintry set of days, and we once again underestimate the number of families that are seeking shelter. Because I, last year, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. We were estimated one number, and, and we had a, a plan, and we had a hearing on the winter plan, and I don't remember anybody saying, gee, this is unrealistically low. I don't remember any of that. I think, and I've said this over and over again, it got me a little bit of controversy that you got a bum rap on this. If, if there was any fault related to DHS, you know, there was the fact that in December, you, the, the, your exits from D.C. General weren't as high as they should have been. That's what I recall you saying. If there's any fault, it lays there. But, you know, you had other issues. Where were the apartments? What were we going to do? And so forth. And so, but it wasn't a callous disregard of a reality that you knew which was coming. Not at all. Not at all. And so, but let's say it happens again. And you've got 200, you've got 230, 200 plus capacity sitting there in DC General that's not being used, and all of a sudden you've got 200 families that want it. What do you think is going to happen? 
So in both scenarios, to my mind, as I've thought about this, and I've thought a lot about this, in both scenarios, you're going to meet someplace else or you're going to have to go back into D.C. General. In both scenarios, there's got to be a plan B in terms of where these families go, either on an emergency shelter basis or in more long-term basis. I don't see any, you know, unless we just say, well, we're, we're only going to house 50 families end of story. That's all we're going to do. You know, that's not legally possible. It's not, it's not politically possible. It's not possible in any way. So I know why, as I analyze it, you're going to need to have some options for these families, for these, for these families can go. Or you fill up D.C. General still again. Um, on May the 6th, which was yesterday, I received from you some additional responses to pre-hearing questions. And your response, I, I asked the question, how much funding is necessary to rehab D.C. General? Your response was, no amount of rehab will make D.C. General appropriate for families. Let me repeat that. No amount of rehab will make D.C. General appropriate for families. This is going to go down into the history books, like your statement that D.C. General as a building is, quote, dead. This is the same thing. I mean, you'll you hear me say this over and use this over and over again, because this is the clincher for me, is that it's very likely, unless we have alternates, under either scenario, then we're going to go back into D.C. General, and D.C. General will still be a mess, in other words. No amount of rehab will make D.C. General appropriate for families. So when I think to myself, well, if we could rehab, if we could rehab D.C. General, if we could make it livable for 50, 100, 150, 250 families, which I don't really contemplate, but if we could do it, if we could do it, then my mind would be different. I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars it would take, but you, you tell me that no amount of money would make it appropriate for families. Am I communicating my concerns here? Yes, sir. So, plan B, we need alternate places. Plan A, we need alternate places. Either way, we need someplace else to send these families, and we don't want a little metropolis of vulnerable, miserable, challenged children and parents again. I mean, I don't see it. So, you know, I listen to the uh, advocates and I say to them, well, they want their motion for D.C. General as they presented it in a very thoughtful plan, by the way, extremely thoughtful plan, you've read it, I'm sure, is 10 more case managers. I don't see it. I don't see it. And this statement from me, which got into my hands this morning, seals the deal. It seals my point of view. It just can't be done. So, your reaction? I look forward to the discussions with the advocates and to the uh, discussions with D.C. General on the planning and, uh, and see how much room for uh, common thinking there is when we get down to that level of discussion. Well, that's where we are. And, and I think that, that, in my opinion, that when you say that a couple of 50-bed facilities is enough, you know, I glom on to that. I say, okay, let's find the, 50, the 250 or 350 bed facilities. Because even though there's an additional expense to all of this, the fact of the matter is that that is more likely to be something that will work. Because we'll be going someplace that has hot water, that has appropriate uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, apartments, that has kitchenettes or whatever, where people can live with dignity. Not here. Right. And when I went to D.C. General, I know this is, you people have heard this over and over and over again, and I saw seven human beings in one hospital room, which I saw there, and you have two. I said, oh, no, 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 this can't be what it's about. And, and two huge mattresses that covered the floor in the rooms, and, and, and that was about it. Um, I was a commissioner of D.C. General from 19... Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Barry. Uh, I was a commissioner appointed by the mayor of the District of Columbia at D.C. General for, for a little more than two years. I remember those hospital rooms when we had sick people in them. They were not intended for families. So I think, unless we want to just, you know, if you said to me, uh, council member, let's take the... Now there's one vacant floor left at D.C. General, and we'll gut it, 
and we'll put in one bedroom apartments, two bedroom apartments, three bedroom apartments, with kitchens and, and laundry and all of that, and bathrooms. That, you know, I, I think that would be something that I might consider. But it's just some of the rest of the building would be empty because nobody would want to go to those apartments through the rest of the place. But you're not suggesting that. And nobody has, there's no money on this budget to do anything even remotely similar to that. And in fact, there's no money on this budget to find a couple of 50 bed facilities. There's no money here for it. And I'm surprised, you know, I mean, uh, like Councilmember Barry, I think very highly of uh, our mayor. And, uh, but I was surprised after all the controversy about Militia Rod and all of what the, the public attention that was brought to bear in all of this, that there was nothing in the budget for the transitioning out of D.C. General. Uh, and I, and you know, I, I get calls from D.C. General once or twice a week telling me there's no hot water. I mean, we're talking about a very basic failure. Uh, and just recently, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Che, I joined with her in introducing a bill to have the, park, the playground put in, in the parking lot, which is a good thing. Pepco wants to pay for it. But uh, it made me wonder, what, can we invest more in this facility? Or should we be investing in someplace else? And I think that's what we got to do. Um, hey, friend. Now, one of the things that happened this year was that we started off with a budget that was $3.2 million in, in this year's budget for hotels, for hotel rooms. And we really thought that was more than enough when we agreed to it in, two, in last year. But now we tell us that the money is up to $5 million plus. So the question there is, where is the additional approximately is almost $3 million coming from. But where did you find it? to? Because we put all these people in hotels in D.C. and Maryland. I mean, where did we find the money to do it? Uh, that was mainly the reprogrammed money, the $9 million that uh, went in that's not in the base budget that, uh, that the mayor found for us for, the, for this year. So there was a reprogramming of $9 million from the mayor? Yeah. And part of that was spent on hotels. Where was the rest of it spent? Uh, well, we're, we're not done with the hotels. That's what we've already spent. No, well, the three total amount for the hotels is going to be nine million. Nine million. So you will use the lion's share of that for right. sure for that right. purpose. Now, what, what about the budget for hotels in FY15? How much is in the budget for hotels in FY15? Nothing. Nothing. So that would suggest to me that if we had three point two million in FY14 and nothing in FY15 with this $3.2 million that is going somewhere else. Where is it going? Uh, into the expansion of rapid rehousing. Ah, so you're taking that money from hotels and putting it into rapid rehousing. Right. But you're not expanding, you're expanding the number of people who could qualify for rapid rehousing, but not expanding the time frame. No. So when, when you get rapid rehousing, I, I suppose people need to hear this, is that you get one 90-day period? Four months. Four, one hundred and 120-day period, and then you're, you're, it's possible to have two extensions. Right. If you make a case for it, it's not automatic, is it? it it's reasonably, uh, the, the client makes the case uh, based on whether they've participated. It's uh, virtually automatic if they're uh, following the plan that they've developed and, uh, uh, and working towards the their self-sufficiency goals. Now, how many, have you done any analysis to indicate how many families, as we've heard people assert, how many families end up back homeless after they've gone through the, the 120 days and the two extensions? Yes. Do you have any analysis of how many succeed as we intend them to and how many don't? Yes, uh, and there's both local and national uh, data on that. And locally, there's a comparison. There's several agencies in addition to DHS that uh, has a rapid rehousing model. Uh, every statistic that I've seen, both nationally and locally, is between uh, 80 to 90 percent of the clients uh, uh, do not end up returning to the uh, homelessness or the shelter system. But 10% do. 
Or 20%. Um, yeah, anywhere between uh, 10 to 20%. Because uh, there's a lot of reluctance by homeless families to accept this. Yes, there is. And, and I've heard testi testimony on that from various people over and over again. That, that we, they, they just are aware that this is going to pull them right back. And then, of course, there's questions about where they're being put. I mean, there are people, too. You know, they they want to live particular places that they're comfortable and not other places where they're not comfortable. So tell me, those two things together are, 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 are discouragement, I think. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, they are, and uh, that's why we're, we built in uh, incentives for uh, landlords to get a, a wider variety of, uh, of apartments for the families to make their choices. Uh, We'll make it, we'll give them a couple of options, but they also can uh, bring forward any apartment that they uh, identify uh, themselves. And so there there are ways that we currently are expanding their choices, uh, and uh, and ways that uh, more landlords are making more apartments available throughout the city. Uh, also, in addition, uh, we found that one of the big reasons why they're not successful mm -hmm. is because of those lacks of supports that they get after they've moved in. And uh, the focus of our one congregation, one family, will not be to be those clients that are seeking to move into rapid rehousing, but rather those that have already uh, identified the unit or have already moved in to uh, make sure that during that year that they have that rapid uh, rehousing program that at the end they really have uh, the wherewithal to be successful. Mm -hmm. How many do you have any, any uh, analysis of the, you know, we had this flood of, of family demand in the winter, in I guess January, February, right. maybe early March. And all of those, let's emphasize, because some people have a different impression, all of those are bona fide ADC residents. And you had to determine residency in each case, didn't you? Right. So we can say that they're all DC residents who were asking for help and shelter, right? Right. How many of those, uh, those families had been on TANF for more than 60 months and were subject, had been subject to the TANF cuts? Okay. Uh, let me start out with the, the general TANF population. 45% of them uh, are the 60-month customers. So uh, that, you know, if you look at just a, a TANF family, 45% chance that uh, you've been on for 60 months or more. Of those that are in shelters or motels, only 61 or only 31%. Uh, are the 60-month customers. So actually, the 60-month customers are uh, are underrepresented within the motels in the hotel uh, settings. Uh, and that that isn't too surprising when you combine that with the fact that uh, half of our customers uh, are led by a, a head of household who's under age 24, mm. who for the most part haven't had enough time to be on their own TANF case. Because you don't count the time that they were on somebody else's case or the time before they turned 18. So uh, uh, very few of those... That's uh, still a significant number. It, it, it's a significant and, and number. One cut, and one of the one of my highest priorities for this budget is to find the money to delay the October 1st cut of 41%. Right. It's one of my highest priorities. And so, and I think we're not going to be able to do everything I want to do, but I think we're going to be able to do that, I hope. But if we cut by 41%, 41% on October the 1st as planned and as in the budget, as is, is in the budget, don't you think that's going to create more family homelessness? Because on 41 percent, and we have the numbers of which I can share, I mean, bringing the town of benefits down to virtually nothing, I mean, $150, something in that order for a family of four, um, at that point, isn't that going to compel people in increasing numbers into homelessness and they're going to show up at the doors? of D.C. General, they're going to show up at the doors of D.C. General, a building which you say cannot be rehabbed successfully and is dead. Am I missing something? Well, we haven't seen the, the correlation or the relationship. I'm not saying it's there, but... Uh, uh, given I'm not saying it isn't there. I'm not saying that it is or isn't there. Uh, we haven't seen it. And the fact that the 60-month uh, customers are actually 
underrepresented within the shelter system. Yeah. It gives me pause to say that there's a strong correlation there, but that, that begs the point that you're right. Uh, uh, any reduction in income for a family that's living already at or below 40% of poverty is, uh, is drastic, and that's why our, uh, our program is about, uh, and in all due respect, you know, we did, the department did not set the time limits. Uh, but the correlation is clear to me no. that if you have less money, and you have significantly less money for a family of four, you know, and you have a 41% cut, that you would have less money to pay for housing, less money to pay for other things. That's right. the core. That's the critical correlation. So I don't think we have to look so much at the numbers previously, as we can assume that people are going to be able to pay less for housing and are going to be thrown into homelessness and at the doors of D.C. General. I don't know how that would be avoided. Yeah. And I don't know how any of them pay for their housing with a grant of $350 a month to begin with even before they have the cuts. Right. But, but I, I, haven't, I have yet to find that 300 or the, the $200 uh, dollar a month apartment in, uh, in D.C. Well, some of them have housing subsidies. Of That's right. Uh, but, but even that ultimately just collapses because you're looking at 300 miles, you've got meals to be, you know, school bags, school supplies, you know, just everything. And you bring a family of 400 to 100. I, I just think that we are cutting off our nose despite our face. We are ensuring a family crisis again in the winter of next year if we cut this TANF benefit to 41 by 41 percent. I mean, I, I don't know how it could be, how any other logic could prevail with this. It's just, it's, and I, I want to later on, uh, it's Mr. Barry's turn, but I want to later on go back to the whole TANF success story if there is one. And I'm not seeing, uh, I'm still not feeling, despite great efforts, the, 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 I'm not feeling confident that our TANF employment programs are working to the extent that I would feel comfortable with a 41% cut. And as you know, that's another whole and separate inquiry. Uh, let me conclude this, this segment by saying, I, I know very well that we're trying to solve poverty. We're trying to solve chronic generational poverty by all of this. Nobody has figured out how to do this. Some states have figured out how to do it by just simply cutting people off and saying, well, good luck. Georgia did that right early on. But I think we want a different approach. We've always wanted a different approach. And uh, I, I, I'm very, very fearful that if we don't have this alternate uh, housing for D.C. General, it will fill up again. Mr. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Every chance I get, I uh, commend you for the tremendous amount of leadership you've shown on this committee. You've taken some humane stands that were not uh, popular among our colleagues, but you've done it. Uh, and I want to thank you for that, for standing up. DHS has some of the most vulnerable citizens in this city very vulnerable citizens. And the person that we serve in DHS has a historical point of view of having become dependent on the D.C. and federal government. There's nothing but dependency over there. It's not their fault. It's not their, their fault they were born into poverty. They had nothing to do with that. None of us can decide how we were born, when we were born, and what circumstances we were born. Whether you're black, white, uh, Latino, anything, you have no choice. That's a decision, I believe, that God makes, not us. And so we shouldn't blame the people who are in poverty for their poverty. Now, of course, you have some people who don't exert themselves as much as they ought to, but the basic thing is that they were not responsible. Whether they were born in Washington, D.C. or New York, they weren't responsible for that. And so we'll take it that way and not try to push the burden back on them. It's the society that has made them dependent. Dependent on Medicaid. Dependent on SNAP. Dependent on subsidized housing. 
dependent on everything, on, on education, free education, on everything. And we mouth that, you all mouth it, Mr. Byrne, your staff, but it hasn't changed nothing. There's not one program that I've seen in DHS that has changed the paradigm in terms of actions. I mean, I believe you and Deborah, I believe everybody believe in their hearts they want to change it. But uh, I learned a long time ago, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And so my discussion is not personal, it's institutional. And you're not responsible for the mayor's decision. I'm a strong supporter of Vincent Gray. I've known him over 35 years or so. I work with him at DCARC to uh, close down Forest Haven. Over a thousand persons out there. It took us 10 years to do it, but we did it. Uh, he and I got elected to the city council at the same time in 2004. Cormac Brown, Benson Gray, and myself used to meet twice a month. I did dinners to talk about a common direction as we go forward. And so we've had these kinds of personal relationships. I've supported him politically. I got out of my sick bed to go campaign for Vincent Gray. And that takes a lot because I told everybody, I'm going to put my health first. I had to persuade the doctors that it was okay to come out and, and do the campaign. I didn't do any walking. We did riding. So I say that to say that I'm disappointed in Prince Gray as it relates to homelessness, as it relates to TANF. Ms. Burns, we said 43, or you said 45% of the people on TANF have been there more than 60 months. Is that correct? Okay, which means that here we are in 2014. You had the discussion, Jim, from your very beginning when you came here. Same discussion. Things have gotten worse. They've not gotten better. Gotten worse. I know how hard it is to, to close these hotels. When I was mayor, it took me a, a little while to do it. But a hotel called Capital City, and Deborah probably knows this, out at New York Avenue and Bladenburg Road. It was a teeming tenement with about, I don't know how many, five or six hundred um, homeless families there. And everybody in my administration was looking and talking, saying, Mr. Mayor, how are we going to do it? I said, we're going to do it. And we finally closed Capital City. We finally closed it. D.C. Village was a, was a, was a mama, a dump of them, closed. So now we've, we've gone backward, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Graham. Yeah. We've gone backward. Yeah. We all admit that D.C. General is no place to have a homeless family. Even Mr. Graham was showing me your, your quote that no amount of rehab would make D.C. General appropriate for family. That is true. Mm -hmm. Hotel rooms is not appropriate. CCNV ought to be rebuilt with three smaller shelters, or four smaller shelters. That's prime property down there. Let's take that money and use it to build three or four smaller shelters that's manageable, that people can, can interact with each other. 13, 1,400 people out there is ridiculous. And so, Mr. Bur Mr. Burns, you have to, I, I know you can't push the map so much, but somebody got to push it. It's outrageous he's going to cut the standard benefits by 41%. And Mr. Graham, you and I, now throughout the day, we ought to just work as hard as we can, look at the whole D.C. budget, to find a way to stop these cuts. Because we have an $11 billion budget. $11 billion. You can tell me, I have an $11 billion budget? 
You can't find enough money to do something that we made a mistake on? It was the government that did all this stuff. It's the government that allowed these people to stay on beyond 60 months. It was the government program that, that did so. Just because it was done wrong, that means we have to keep it going. So, Ms. Graham, I, I, I pledge myself to work as hard as I can with you and with Anita Bonds on the committee uh, to, to identify enough funds throughout this big old budget that we have. I want to talk with the chairman about it. I'm going to talk with other colleagues of ours that got big budgets and see if we can't get the money out of there. I'm not for any tax increases because that's just self-defeating. But I'm, I'm for redistribution through which we come in. So, Mr. 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 Burns, since there's no additional money to close the family shelters, what do you expect us to do on the council? You expect us to go along with that? What do you expect? No, just, uh, I, I'm trying to, the, the funds that uh, we have in the mayor's budget uh, takes what we've been spending on hotels and uh, and uh, um, major portions. But tell me about it. With three million more added to the budget, would that cover closing the family shelter? Well, Will that cover the uh, these hotels? It's the reinvestment of the savings from uh, not using hotels and from reducing the capacity at DC General is going into the rapid rehousing. Can, can I get it? Yes, I know. Does this money mean we'll get folks out of hotels? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Well, Dim and I. I have a slight different opinion only because of timing. I mean, a hotel room is better than than nothing, than a car, than agony in the recreation center. So we may have to settle for that uh, in the meantime. To me, D.C. General has a higher priority, Jim, to be closed than these hotels at this point. Just, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be, it'd be, we, could you support a priority of closing D.C. General and keep these hotels going? Could you support that? I know about to talk with the mayor about it, but. Yeah, uh, the, that, that is not the current plan. The plan that's on the table, the one that I've discussed. I know it's is to I mean, uh, I know, I understand okay, uh, And I'm telling you that uh, uh, the plan <laughs> I support is the uh, is the mayor's plan. Well, the mayor's plan is a faulty plan. It's anti-humanity. It's anti-everything. And that doesn't make any sense to me, so we'll proceed on. With maybe maybe the, the council could do something about setting their priorities rather than you. Since you can't go get some air, I understand that. When I was mayor, I didn't expect my department heads to go down the road somewhere I wasn't going. So I understand that. I'm not trying to put you in a, in a bind. So the priority is to close DC. Yeah. The, the sure. mayor's priority is to close both. And you're asking which ones first. And, uh, and I'm saying the plan that's on the table, the one that uh, the mayor has proceeded with is to close the uh, hotels and then to uh, uh, first and then to reduce the capacity at the end. Is wrong. to do both. The mayor is wrong. Why didn't he put enough money in it to simultaneously do both? Now, you can't answer that. I don't want you to answer that. But I can say he should have put money in out of an $11 billion budget to close both simultaneously yeah. as we get rapid rehab, rapid, rapid housing, as we get landlords to take vouchers and other things, as we build uh, uh, renovated housing, et cetera. The problem is that the problem is so massive that there are no easy solutions. But who said it would be easy? It's not easy. Your job is not easy. Deborah's job is not easy. Other people in the administration at the top of this is not easy. The, uh, but, but you took the job knowing it wouldn't be easy, so I'm not going to take that thing. Now, 
As I understand it, even now, you had budgeted two million dollars for hotels, and I've been told by my staff that it's now five million dollars. Is that accurate? Well, with 3.2, it wasn't budgeted. It's what I allocated within the uh, the, uh, the money that you uh, appropriated for. How much you allocate? Uh, 3.2. How much is it now, so far? It's over 5 million, and it'll probably be 8 million by the end of the year. That means that we're talking about $5 million over what was anticipated. Yes. How did that happen? Do you have more people in hotels than you anticipated? Very okay. much so. We're going to have another one. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll Go ahead. Uh, let, me, let me just have maybe a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, that's all. As nice as I am, Mrs. Mr. Mr. <laughs> we're not David Catania now. I should hope not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't act like it. <laughs> So embarrassed the other day, Mr. 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 Graham, when the, the uh, head of Ramada was talking to me about employment. He says, and I'm talking about only 14% DC residents working up there, and we put over $400 million in, in subsidy. He said, we get more DC residents outside of that process than we do from DOS. And that, that was embarrassing. That our own agency, which is supposed to be getting jobs for people, couldn't do it. So I, I'll uh, wait till the next round. But be ready, Mr. Burns, to give me some suggestions about how we get more jobs for tenant employees, I mean, tenant recipients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perry. We're, we're going to be here for a while. So you know, if you're going to be here, You've got plenty of time to ask questions, and you'll have plenty of time to answer questions. I hope. I hope you have the time today. Um, savings. We're going to get more money one way or the other, and you tell me that there's going to be savings. If we can bring D.C. General down to 162 families, what's the savings? And how would you achieve that savings? Are you going to, are you going to cut the community partnership contract? Are you going to, what, what do you do to achieve that savings? As we and how much money is it? Yeah, as we decrease the capacity, we'll be able to uh, close units, and then we get the savings back. Uh, uh, we won't have, uh, as I was uh, talking with uh, Councilmember uh, Barry's question, uh, we won't have savings in the D.C. general part of it until we empty the hotels. And, uh, and I would say that... Uh, but you have no budget for hotels in FY15. That's right. So well, how far have savings? I mean, we're going to enter the hotels by July 15th. So there's not going to be any FY15 savings. I'm talking about FY15 savings. And on the other hand, if we close DC General by the 30, no later than the 31st of December, it's costing us $1 million plus a month to operate that little metropolis with no services to speak of. And so we'll save nine months of operating costs, which is nine million dollars plus, nine million dollars plus in operating costs, which we would redeploy into the rapid rehousing because well, we can't empty uh, DC General unless we uh, have a place for the families to go. Well, I, well, that's we're the one in that decision where you redeploy the money. But what I would do is I would use at least portion of this money to establish what you refer to as a couple of. 50 bed facilities and provide the operating costs there. I mean, that's, you know, and I, I think we could do more than a couple with $9 million. 
Uh, Mr. Bernard, would we be given the ability to see that as savings in FY15? Oh my God, you're not listening? <laughs> oh my goodness. I said that if, if we close DC General in its entirety, no later than the 31st of December, that's the third month of the fiscal year. There'd be nine months left of the fiscal year, and we spend $1 million plus per month for that facility. Uh, I assume that the CFO would see that as savings in FY15. There'd be nine months of savings if there was no DC General operating. There, there should be savings if DC General is not, but as Director Burns is saying, what do we do? How, where do we place the people? And no, that's a separate issue. I mean, I'm just but we have savings. If, we don't, if we don't have DC General operating mm -hmm. for nine months, there's got to be money that we don't have to spend. Yes. And there's so those would be, you, you think that would be viewed as savings in the FY15 budget? It would be viewed as, as Could savings. Could you speak over the microphone? It your, would your, be viewed as savings. Well, if we have savings, so there's nine million dollars plus. I think it's closer to twelve million dollars, but uh, because of the the excess costs associated per month to operate DC General, I mean, so let's just say ten to twelve million dollars savings in the FY15 budget. Now I don't know why that money can't be taken and put into alternate facilities, and and also for that matter, I, I, what I hear, and I, you know, other people say what they want, but. What I hear from families is that when they go to a hotel, it's much preferable, much preferable to be in DC General, because you got your kitchenette, you got your cable TV, you got your, you know, you got some sense of privacy. You got a private door, you come and go. You know, all of that like, makes you feel more like a human being. Might it be crowded? Yes, it might be crowded, but it's more of a sense of of of, of quality in a hotel. So I have some if we if we if we have hotels as our fallback and we operate several other new facilities, not in one place, then that's a much preferred outcome. If if we do not reinvest whatever savings we get from both hotels and DC General into options for housing, such as rapid rehousing, we won't have to uh, we wouldn't be able to just open a couple of uh, uh, small facilities. We would have maybe three or four hundred people that we would have to open another facility for. Because we're predicating the fact that there's going to only be uh, 100 or 150 people at DC General on taking that money and putting it into rapid rehousing. If we do not put that into rapid rehousing and housing options, then we'll still have four, five, six, seven hundred people uh, at uh, DC General and in hotels, and then the alternative plan would have to be for uh, uh, moving four, five, six, or seven hundred people into another location. So. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that holds up under uh, close examination. Yes. I don't know how you get, I mean, the money for increasing rapid rehousing is in the budget, number one. It's in the budget, but you tell us it's a savings from a reduced number at D.C. General. But if you have 162 families in D.C. General, where today there are 280, that's 118. That's 118. And I don't know how necessarily how that translates in an efficiency of scale basis into that kind of savings. I don't see it. And I don't know how you do it contractually. I don't know how you get you get DC, the community partnership to reduce their contracts. And then you bump right up against the issue of quality of service. You've heard the advocates want 10 more case managers. You're not going to do some case managers when they want more. Wow. And a lot of what's going on there right now it ain't no good. Those case managers, if we reduce the capacity at DC General, then uh, those uh, people could be doing the case management while the families are in rapid rehousing so that they're successful at the end of that period. And by the way, let me drop a footnote to this. You know, I've been very involved in La Casa, you know that, at 1400 block of building, right in the center of the Columbia Heights retail district with new apartments and everything else. I have fought for those 40 units of permanent supportive housing. I don't see any money to support them. I don't see any operational money in the budget to support those four apartments. And your answers to our questions say it's there, but we don't see it. What is that money? It's uh, within that entire continuum of care. Like I say, uh, 
It's a redeployment of the funds that we have, the efficient use of it, uh, any case. I'd like to have some confidence. You know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to do a back of the envelope budget here. Right. There's, there's $500 million in this budget. You know, and I'm just not going to go here, here, Jim, just take that as a, a, a moment of faith for us. You know, I really don't want to do that. And one of the things I'm going to ask you today, and I'm asking it now, I guess, I didn't mean to, is I want to see where the La Casa budget is, and I want to see how much it is in dollars and cents. Because I don't see it. And we asked you, we asked, asked you an express question on this, and you dodged it by saying the money was there, but not telling us how much it was going to cost. So I think, well, if we have the money, our CFO, Mr. Barnard, has said that we'll have $9 million, you can take a portion of that and put it into rapid rehousing. You can do that. Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, we're trying to move on. Please, Mr. Barrett. There's a hallway, there's offices, one or two offices. Yeah, I don't believe the savings are going to be actually an entire whole $9 million. Because I'm sure some of that will go back into getting people out, mm -hmm. moving people. Give or take, give or take. You know, you know. But I think, what, what is the cost per month to operate DC General? Is it one point six million? million? It's roughly a million. Oh, no, it's more than a million. Uh, it's thirteen million. So it's just just less a million, less than one point one million dollars. So the more we just deal with the you know, a million. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the fact of the matter is that all the things that are before us today, the greatest savings in my mind. Closing DC General, the greatest savings in, million, in, in millions of dollars, and the greatest threat comes on from the notion of keeping it open for the purposes of 162 families. It should be 280 again by 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 February 1st. I, I you know I love the crystal ball that works any better than yours, but I'm willing to I'm willing to wager that the pressures of family homelessness, particularly with a 41 percent cut in tariff. On October the first is going to assure that result, and now I mean, whoever is sitting in this seat next year, who's ever in the council, whoever is the mayor, is going to have to figure out what to do. They have to figure out what to do because they'll be back in the same uh, bucket of yogurt that we were in earlier this year. Same duck soup is what I meant to say. Exactly the same. On the other hand, if we said ourselves, let's shut this thing down, let's shut it down, and let's get alternate facilities in place. Uh, let's really use the savings wisely and go from there. I think it's a much better. Don't you agree, Mr. Mr. I know you're duty bound to support the mayor's oh. plan, but can't you at least see some of the wisdom in this approach? I see the wisdom in the approach. I don't see the wisdom in the math. Oh, okay. uh, and, well, how do uh, I understand that? Okay, uh, we have a set amount of money that's in the continuum of care, and uh, we're spending uh, a lot of that that. Uh, uh, has been in, including $9 million more that the mayor gave us uh, this year. But that's not a curve. That's not yeah, a curve. That's right. But uh, that's, that's money that's been going in to uh, pay for the hotels and for uh, mm -hmm. running the D.C. General uh, at maximum capacity for virtually the whole year because it, it uh, and all of those kinds of things. But the, the money that's allocated, uh, uh, you give to us uh, on a line item that we basically call the continuum of care. It's my job to move that around and, and deploy it in the best way that... Uh, no, it's our job. No, no, it's, no, 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 no. no but, it's our job to approve the budget submitted yeah. by the mayor. Now, please don't say that because it's, it's, it's not music to my ears. It's our job to approve the budget or disapprove the budget submitted by the mayor to this council. It is not your job to move monies around like you feel like. It's not the case, Mr. Burns. No. It's not. Please don't say that. Because if that's the case, then I'd rather be watching TV or uh, walking in the sun or doing something else. Because if you see this as just that kind of formal formality, this hearing and this, this process, then I, I'm really not comfortable continuing this. No, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying no, that's that what we're the line item that you've given us, I have to manage it. You, you don't approve, you'll get $400 to this family, $300. That, it, it, that well, we, do have, we could call it whatever line items we wanted to. Right. And it's my intention to create a line item for hotels. It's my intention to create a line item for alternate facilities. And it's my intention to propose to my colleagues, all of this is up to them, I'm only one vote, right. that they will shut D.C. General by the, 21st of, by the 31st of December. And, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be as specific as I can be because I don't want, 
I want to do this. And I just say, you can't do it, Jim. We're not going to agree with you. That's different. Let them do that. Let them make it. But I'll have discharged my responsibility. Mr. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I was talking on the phone because I had a, a very, I know it. I, you were right. You can't do two things at once. I understand that. You know, you can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. I'm not sure I for it. <laughs> this is a very serious conversation. And uh, Mr. Graham, I support the general direction that you're going of closing the family shelter by December 31st. I support that. And the council does have the authority to say that no appropriated money can be spent on the family shelter at D.C. General uh, after December 31st. That's right. We have that authority. So I'll just get ready. Get ready. Now, you, the, the mayor may moan and groan about it, but we have that authority. We have, I think you're on to something here. Uh, you and I have come to an agreement that we do all we can to keep these hotel rooms, and I don't like them, at least have them available because they're better than D.C. General. At least in a hotel room, you got a shower, individual shower. you got a bathroom. you got a commode. you got a sink. you got some privacy in the bathroom. Whereas at D.C. General, you got a common bathroom. Can you imagine? you got to get out of your bed, dress, halfway dress, to put robes or something on, to go down to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Well, in a hotel, if you want to wake up, Mm -hmm. Go to a naked. That's your business, mm -hmm. you know. And so I like this direction. I think we'll try to do the same thing with the tenant cuts. How much are they, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Forty-one. To, to, uh, let me answer that question. How much are they? To delay them for three months, for six months, would cost us three million dollars. To delay them for a year would be six million. Okay, let's let's let's, let's focus on six million dollars. You know, some of it may come within the department. Maybe a higher priority programs and low priority over here that we don't we just cut out, don't do. So we'll be looking at that. I know I the chairman and I we're gonna spend our time trying to identify six million dollars in savings in the department, out of the department if we're going forward. We're gonna we're gonna mandate that the shelters be closed by December 31st and that no appropriated funds can be spent by the city government on D.C. General after that date. Now, that would be legally binding. Now, see, the other problem I have, Mr. Mr. Chairman, is that we shouldn't dump all these problems on Mr. Muir Bowser who would be our next mayor. Right. Yeah, we don't want to dump. That's what happened when I became mayor. Uh, Walter Washington dumped all this stuff on me, and I had to try to clean it up. When I ran in 94, we had a $331 million cash deficit dumped on me. And I know how it feels to be dumped on something you didn't have responsibility for. Now, in another area of training, Mr. Burns and Deborah, how many tenant recipients do we have in some kind of training? I'm going to turn that over to Deborah, who has yeah. more specifics. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that. There are about 6,200 customers currently, about 6,230 uh, customers actively or referred for training. Um, and of those. How many are in training? How many are actually in? We have approximately 2,000 customers that we've identified that have not been actively engaged. About 2,100 customers who we know have not been actively engaged in the programs of those that are assigned. So the difference is. Out of 6,000 has been referred. Right. So we said 2,000 have not been engaged. So about 4,000, a little more than 4,000 customers are currently actively engaged. They're either employed 
And we all have to put it out. Put it out. Okay. How many of those 4,000 are actually employed? Of the 4,000? Yes. Um, I believe the number is. was somewhere around um, 1,800, I believe, customers that were employed. I have a that are employed. That are employed. And that's a combination of full and part-time employment. Well, I'm talking about full-time. I'm going to have full-time employment. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. That's... You want to ask that kind of question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Thank you. One thousand six hundred and seventy nine customers are employed. Full-time. Full -time. And of those... Those are full-time employees. Average salary. Um, we have. There's. I think the larger percentage of our customers are being paid between eight and ten dollars an hour. A minimum wage. Right. And then. Um, now I'm not majority. What number? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I employ with four thousand. What number you say? How many of them are employed? At an average salary of eight to ten dollars. We have it. Yeah. I have that number. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those right now the data I have is is showing it in percentages. Um, of, of those that are engaged, 18% of them, um, excuse me, as of the la of FY14, 19% are earning wages higher than $12.50 a year. 19% of the 4000 19% that come to? Mm. About $800? And then 22% um, are earning wages between $10 an hour and $12.50 an hour. And 53% are earning wages between $7.50 and $10 an hour. And that doesn't get a lot of property, does it? No. But we begin to get a lot of property. Not in the District of Columbia, does it? It does not do that. And so I think it's a start, though. Well, okay, that's not a good attitude. Well, it's, it's a good start. The other thing would be that you know, I'm not satisfied with any of this. Well, we don't. Uh, we're all victims of a society that doesn't care about this population. And so, therefore, I can't hold you responsible for those employers who are not in front of these workers. I don't hold you responsible for trying to be creative and get the man involved. The only way to get out of the public problem to some extent is the mayor himself has to be intimately involved on a daily basis talking to these private sector companies. And also, we have a, a program of the public sector. We have to carve out X number of jobs uh, for tenant workers and develop a training program and get them ready. government that don't have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. they don't, you know, a lot of them, they're not in good jobs, they, they're in mid-level jobs. And so I, I was with, we talked to you later, I was with you later, about that, and I try to figure out some language we can put, and we really say that uh, a crime to, to do better, even though it's going to be tough. Well, I can tell you that um, I'm participating in a work group with the Workforce Investment Council on looking at chronic unemployment. This is something that was um, part of the mayor's um, desire for us to come up with a plan to work with those that um, are, you know, to figure out a, a plan to address the needs of those who are chronically unemployed. Um, within our own programs, we've done some things in, in, within, our, within the TANF employment program where we've expanded our work um, experience opportunities so that we have customers throughout different agencies and and within, um, not just within DHS, but in other parts of the D.C. government, where they get four-month 
uh, rotations of work experience so that they can build their resume. Uh, similarly, we've been working very closely with the Department of General Services. Any construction contract that has district dollars on it, um, we've been asking them to include in there that they engage customers that are coming out of our sweat equity program so that they can get actual work. Is that happening now? Yes, it is happening. How do we in that program? We are actually working on our third cohort in the sweat equity program. Um, those that were in the original co cohort that worked at Swain, uh, Wayne Place, um, most of them have gotten employment. How many, how many people? It's right now somewhere around 45 total, I think, no. at most. At that rate, we'll be a million years. Well, you know, right. construction training is very expensive. I don't know that. I don't know that. Yeah. So... I don't know that being a housing committee for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked on the construction uh, contracts at Town Elementary and it's so I know all of that. What I'm asking though is that we do things a lot differently, which I'll discuss with you later. There is try to increase the amount. Have you ever been in a discussion with the hotels about hiring? I've talked about this before. So, uh, we've been working with the, one of our providers who actually was awarded a contract with the Department of Employment Services to do the hospitality um, intermediary work. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the hotels. There must be this, I don't know, there, there are over 30 hotels in right, this town. Right, but I believe the hospitality um, intermediary is actually the ones working directly with the hotels, and our customers will go are going through no, that program. I'm not about the intermediary. Okay. First of all, the workforce investment only has a budget of about
satisfaction in my own eyes, my own body. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't lift the rest of the people. I couldn't do anything. I began to be and to be turned into me. I couldn't turn this thing over. But because I had a good God and some good doctors, and because I'm not a part of this community, uh, I'm back. This blood infection kills about 30 people. you've done for the District of Columbia over the years and, you know, stay after HBO, you know, that, whatever's going on there. <laughs> I don't know, you better watch your life history and it's going to take the money and win. I'll just finish my book, let me know June 17th, yeah. and you look at Amazon.com <laughs> and order for 18 dollars and something. The book costs 25 dollars, so if you want to have a little savings, Look on Amazon.com and get your big order. <laughs> I think that's a commercial message. <laughs> I won't be going. It's okay, though. It's okay, yeah. though. I hope you're getting a lot of royalties. I'm doing all right. Okay. <laughs> um, right. Department of Human Services. Right. Okay. Here we are again. Well, uh, I, I tell you what, it would be helpful to me to have the details of these savings and the details of how all of this is going to operate in FY15. In FY14, as I understand it, we're going to have 500 of the current 680 homeless families that are housed today. I think that's 680. Am I right? How many homeless families are in housing right this moment? Uh, in hotels or DC general? Or? I can't hear you. It's about, I think it's, okay, I'm, I have to do the math really quick. Is that okay? Will you accept 680 for the purposes of a discussion? 575, is that what? Yeah. 575? There's 280 at D.C. General, and there's there's 300 in the, 400. 
How many in the hotels? There's 299. Okay, all right. All right. So there's 200 in D.C. General, am I right? 276, today's census, and 299 in hotels. 299. Okay, so that's... That's 15, that's 17, 575. 75, right. Okay, okay, but that makes my point even better. Because by July the 15th, the mayor is committed to taking 500 of these, 500 of these families out of the hotels, out of D.C. General, and my math suggests that there'll be 75 left. Well, we've already counted, uh, I think, uh, about 85 of those have already exited, so that's the difference. So, so we should add the 85 to 575. Right, yeah. Well, that's what I was trying to uh, do, but uh, uh, you told uh, me not to. 162, uh, from when we started to 500. Uh, how many will buy, how, will there be 75 at D.C. General on October the 1st, 2014, when the fiscal year begins? Give or take. Give or take. Uh, all right. Yes. So that's all we have left. Nobody in the hotel. Right. 75 families, give or take, at D.C. General. That's all we have left. Now, when, uh, the hearing that the, the mayor had with the council, I asked Mr. Gray directly. I said, when you take people out of D.C. General, will you fill the vacancies? And his answer was unequivocal. It was no. Now, you guys have come up with some other kind of response. And I mentioned this to the mayor the other day. I said, DHS apparently didn't get the message. They didn't get the memo. Because you said to my mayor, he remembered saying no. And he said he didn't understand that. So we have just contact. Have you gotten a call from me? I have not, but uh, I, if there's other guidance, I will stand correct. Okay, well, let's say that you don't do it anymore. You don't fill any vacancy. Then all we're talking about in terms of the closure of D.C. General, and I wish people would understand this, if things go according to plan, is 75 give or take. Well, and that's what the plan is, that even if we take any more in, we won't go over 75. Uh, it's uh, when we start going down. So, by your scenario and by my scenario, there's only 75. Right. To close D.C. General once and for all. Right. But if those 75 remain in D.C. General, I, I fear, you know the right, and I may be dead wrong, I know that, but I feel that there's going to be a tendency to fill up the other rooms. I fear that will happen. And then before I know it will be 100, and then it will be 120, and then it will be, you know, because there will be great pressures to put people in there when it's cold. We're living in bus stations to, at that time. But so all we have to do is to remove 75 people. Well, if there's 75 people here on October 1st, what would be the amount of the contract to, to the community partnership? What is your plan in terms of reducing the amount of that contract? The the plan, as uh, we've discussed, is... What is the contract today? 800000 something like that? A month? No? It's, it's about, um, I think, $7 million in total annually okay. for services. Okay, so $7 million divided by 12, help me, is about, uh, what, about $70,000, $80,000 a month? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so not far. Right. So, what, so if, if they're going to say they're getting $60,000 a month, let's just say they're getting $60,000 a month. And on October the 1st, 2014, at the beginning of the FY15 fiscal year, we're down to 75. That reduces the census by more than 200 at DC General compared to today. So what are our plans in terms of savings on the, on the community partnership contract? And how does that fit, fit factor into this budget? That factors, I'm sorry, that factors into the budget that uh, we have planned on using any additional or, or uh, any of the funds that don't go into either hotels or into D.C. General will go in to support the families that were moving into rapid rehousing. I see that. But let me ask you this. You must have done some financial analysis as to come up with those totals on rapid rehousing. So you must have some kind of sense of how much you're going to reduce, what kind of savings you're going to get out of the community partnership contract. Are you going to continue to pay them as oh. if they were two other family families? So how much is the contract going to be d d reduced? I don't have those numbers. Do you have them anywhere? Yes, we've looked at it uh, in terms of uh, general, not uh, under the penny, but uh, uh, 
within uh, the closest million dollars of that total amount of money that we're spending for. But it's more else where the savings come from. The savings would come from a reduction in the savings that we're going to use for rapid rehousing. I've got to blur down a little bit here because I want to know that we're dealing with something that isn't airy fairy, that it's real. And the savings from DC Journey that I have in mind would be that for nine months there will be no operating costs whatsoever. Now, there'd be demolition costs if you tear it down. There'd be some, you'd have to keep the pipes heated, and you know, there'd be some minimal costs. But generally speaking, and there'd be some transitional costs, as you pointed out, Mr. Bernard. But the fact of the matter is, that's where a substantial savings would come under my scenario. Under my scenario, the savings can only come from the community partnership contract, reducing it, and from the reduction in operating costs associated with utilities and so forth. Because why don't pay mortgage fees? Right. Do we? Yeah. Because we're on the building and the land. So, how, do we, how much are we planning on enhancing rapid rehousing by? Four million? Oh, no. Much more than that. How much? Uh, the, the total budget is somewhere between 20 to 25 million dollars. And how much of an enhancement is that? Uh, do you have that? It's about 50%. Yeah. For the increased number of. How much would that be? About 12 million. And where's the 12 million coming from? From the reduction in the number of hotels, the number of people. Okay. In, yeah. Okay. So certainly, if you only have 300 people in hotels, we have a $3.2 million budget, and you tell me that that's not going to be spent or accounted for in FY15. So you have at least $3.2 million there. And if you get out of any of the new money, the new cash you got from the mayor is not reoccurring. So you don't have anything there. So there's no savings there. So you've got maybe $3.2 million for hotels. And you've got whatever I reduce the community partnership contract by. And you've got whatever you uh, save on utilities. Right. How does that come to $12 million? Well, we'll, we'll show you the, uh, the math. I don't have it right in front of me. Well, I would like to see it. Because, again, I want to know. I mean, I don't want to say that it is believable. Because right. I think it, in the scenario that I'm suggesting has a believable savings has a believable savings. And you would have your savings for three months, forgive me. You'd have your planned savings for three months, and then you'd have my planned savings for nine months at a much greater level. And with that combined monies, we can have alternate facilities, both in terms of uh, uh, the 50 beds that you're talking about, in terms of some emergency housing, and in terms of hotels. We can, I believe we could do it all, and that's why tomorrow we're meeting with the advocates, and I think we can prepare such a plan that captures the existing savings and, and provides for the closure of DC General entirely. Um, I, I, I know you're not entirely comfortable with drilling down this much, but that's what we've got to do, because otherwise I don't know what uh, this is about. Just one thing, though, I don't think that will be enough savings for a new facility as such. Well, we couldn't rent a facility for that? Um, you know, well, we'll have to look into it. But I'm not talking about buying a new facility. You know, about, I mean, are there not buildings that we could rent? You know, well, that's a possibility. Well, we have, one one has three family shelters. Actually, it's two and one across the street. And two of those are, you know, one is a 24 million apartment building, and one is a 50 unit apartment complex, I think. 45 unit. 45, okay. Yep. okay. <laughs> oh, my, you're going to hold me to the last number, right? <laughs> God, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I drew a little bit in place. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Director. <laughs> We're staying civil, aren't we? But anyway, on Spring Road, there's about 45 units. Park Road, 45, and Spring Road is 28 units. No, the opposite. Yeah. Yep. Okay, sorry. Okay, the opposite. So Thank Park Road is 45, Spring Road is 28. But still about 60 mm -hmm. some units. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we begin now, and, and uh, Rolanda pointed out that we could be using uh, FY14 supplemental dollars converted to Paygo Capital, because we're going to have a surplus in FY14, we know that. If there was a will, we could go out and get these facilities. And I tell you right now, I don't know if my other colleagues can speak for themselves, Rob Long will do its moderate share. Moderate share. And we'll have facilities uh, in the one I'm sure that we could explore. I don't know whether they pan out or not, but we'll do our share. But we don't want a minus facility left like DC General. We don't want it. It doesn't work. And uh, I think you've got a bum rap, Director Burns, on this 
crisis in February. I, I honestly do, and I've argued with reporters and so on. But, the, but well, it almost doesn't matter anymore. No, it doesn't matter. Because the perception is out there. Yeah. The DC Journal is a dead place mm -hmm. in a dead building, and there's nothing we can do to make it better, and there's going to be more militia rods in the future than there have been in the past. That's, that's what people think. That's what people say to me. It's, get out of there. And so unless you have a strategy, and I don't see any money for the strategy, to turn around public opinion in a meaningful way, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do. And that's the view. And, and you're in the midst of all of this, just by the way, dropping a footnote, you're going to have a change of administration. And so all of the other things, we're going to have an upturned drawer of people and policies and approaches and strategies. And whether it's Mayor Katana, or whether it's Mayor Bowser, or Mayor somebody else, it's going to be very different. And things are going to be chaotic for a period of time uh, by comparison to the stability of when you have a mayor in place. And you know, I think anything can happen. Well, I make my point the best I could. Uh, on page, um, on question 19 of your responses to the committee, uh, You, see, you tell us that for the all of FY14, DHS has exhausted funds available for new placements into family shelter. You have no more money for new placements of family shelter. So what do you propose to do if there's additional family need? And then you say, however, when the 500 families program meets its intended exits, sufficient savings may be generated to resume placement into DC General, when occupancy drops below approximately 100 families. But all of that is your new standards. That's got nothing to do with the law or anything this council has approved. Now, do you see any response to the question number 19? Right. What do you mean by all of that? Well, I did, as I was saying, if the mayor has said we will make no more, more placements, then, uh, uh, then I will stand corrected. But uh, the idea was within that continuum of care, if we uh, are as successful as we intend to be with the 500 families in uh, uh, getting the, uh, the numbers down so that uh, we actually, let, let's say, completely exhausted, there were no families left whatsoever in our shelter system, uh, then uh, the sa there would be minor savings that we had not anticipated that we would use to make those very mm -hmm. high priority, humane uh, decisions that we could to uh, provide a place for those in very emergent situations. Right. I want to come back to that in just a minute, but I don't want to lose this. That's what you saw in, in question 19. You say, you've exhausted all funds available for new placements into family shelter. You're telling us that in April 2014. Go to the next page. Will you confidently assure us that DHS does not anticipate a spending pressure within the homeless services budget in FY14? Do you follow me? That's right. Uh, so on the one hand, we have no money left, and it's April, and, and, yeah, and, and we have a hyperthermia season, don't we? I think we have a hyperthermia season when people sweat and are miserable due to the heat in Washington. That's yet to occur. But you tell us that there'll be no spending pressure in homeless services. Is that because you're going to turn your back on homeless families? No. It's uh, because we're uh, continuously looking for efficiencies and ways to live within the, the line items that you've given us, not to make inappropriate uh, shifts between line items, but within the continuum monies. Uh, we'll be able to make the adjustments within our budget to uh, keep from having to uh, to come back in. So I don't think we're going to need reprogramming? Uh, well, to the extent that uh, we'll be able to do that, uh, help me with the, what, what flexibility I have on the reprogramming with well, the Well, it's the mayor's flexibility. It's the mayor's flexibility. Yeah. Because you're telling me, I mean, I just, I don't understand how these two statements can coexist on uh, a page of each other. Well, point. what we've done, we've looked at the different line items within the continuum, and if we realize, based on historical information, that funds are going to be underspent, what we've done is just reallocated the money focused to those areas where we need it. But, 
Mr. Bernard. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go on and on about this. In fact, I'm going to leave this. But your, the statement is DHS has exhausted funds available for new placements. Exhausted funds. Well, the, the, within the continuum, there are specific line items. There's, there are line items. But items you know, for, 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 best, for, for that specific center. purpose. But we might have another line item where there might be underspending. And that's what Director Boone said. And well, what might that be? Um, we looked at um, ERAP. We looked at what is what is the particular, you know. We might look at that and see how much we're paying per month, based, do a projection based on where we would be at the end of the, of the year, and we can look at that. Um, we can look at case management. It's based on how many clients you serve per month. If you're serving less than we anticipated, we do a projection and see if there are savings we can pull from there. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. We go through the line items, look at the contracts, do projections. If we see, as of September 30th, we are not projecting to use what's in the budget. Um, you know, we take that to Director Burns and he can make a decision on how he wants those funds reallocated. Okay, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. That's not what this says. No. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't that, say that. I think that it comes from that, yes. but it doesn't say that. It yes. says, talks instead about how there's going to be savings, there may all be savings generated when, when the placements in D.C. general, or when the occupancy drops below 100 families. That's yes, what they're, they're, yes. So, so it's all a family yes. support service. Yes, we, we look at but it. But the other thing is here, and, and, and this, is, this is the type of sentence that really sets off my radar. Because in the same response on question 19, you say, if necessary, you say, the capacity in D.C. general will be no more than 150 with no use of hotels. Then you say, quote, if necessary, a small overflow capacity could be added to DC General during hypothermia alerts. You see how the the, the door is left open. Small, but small will start with twenty. Then it'll become forty. Then it'll become eighty. Then it'll become a hundred. You know. Okay, I think I made my point. I, I I hope we can continue to talk about this because sure. the mayor has pledged to me that in personal conversations that he is going to try to figure this out. I think the $500,000 for planning allowing to this issue is a, is, is a step in the right direction. But I, I'm just, you know, one of the things about this is that I don't have to worry about this after January the 1st. I don't have to worry about this. But, the, but somebody has to worry about this. And I am absolutely convinced that D.C. General, in terms of quality housing, doesn't work. And everything you've told me agrees with that. Everything you've told me, Director Burns, agrees with that. Let's take a look at TANF, because I think we've got other sets of very important issues here. Uh, now, you tell us that you're going to add new vendors. And I tell you, you I see you spending, you report spending at this time, I think we're spending $40 million on TANF vendors. $40 million. The total budget for vendors. Just in vendors. Well, what does it, it include besides vendors? Well, we also have agreements with um, University District of Columbia. We, there are uh, grant agreements that we utilize uh, those dollars for. Well, I mean, Paige, you might want to join with, with me on the question so we know we're both talking about the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's my email. Right, I know, but it's, it's question number, we can get this straightened out. It's question number five. 39, 46. Um, and it's the, the, the chart. Mm -hmm. Job placement vendors. The, uh, FY 2015 local budget, 18 million. And then uh, new provider agreements estimated to 29 million. So you've got $37 million all told in FY 15 that I see here. Am I right? That's about right. For 15, yes. Well, that's what, that's what you're done. I mean, that's what we're estimating to spend, yeah. Right. $37 million. Now, currently, these, the new providers are going to account for, we're going to put $29 million more into this than what we have at present under the proposed budget, right? Right, but they're not all contract vendors. So. Well, I mean, they're. Uh, that's true, but, but we don't know whether we're going to spend this money, are we? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to one provider of limits is going to be eight million, uh, and it goes from there. Uh, 
Or is this, wait, 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 wait. Is the MT Marion plus the name provider, maybe this chart is badly written. Is it the MT Marion plus the name provider agreements, et cetera, yes. total 29? Yes, that's Okay, correct. so I shouldn't have 29 to 18. No. Yes. So we have a total of 30 million. That's what we're proposing in FY15. Right. Not 40 million, but 30 million dollars. Well, that's the local dollars. Yeah. Right. And then we've got another 10 million in federal money. Right. That's where I was. Mm -hmm. And together it's a 4 million dollar expenditure. Mm -hmm. So with 40 million, that's where I was. Thank you. You're very helpful to me, Miss Carroll. Uh, but so with 40 million dollars, I know the public would want me to ask, what's the achievement? What are the outcomes? Well, when I spend that money and we have a... Well, well I was looking at the I mean, that would require you to on a crystal ball. I right. Mean, I'd rather not bring out the crystal ball. Let's look at what you've achieved this year. Mm -hmm. Not today, because we have those numbers. And this is what we'll talk, let's talk about employment. Uh, we have employed clients, a total of 2,500 employed. Am I right? And full time is a thousand. It's actually gone up since since this last quarter. Yeah, but I gotta use what you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's not fair. I mean, I'm because sorry. I've got this document here from you all. I've got it. Please let me use this. Which, this is a, which one are you this using? Is page five. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Question six, page five. Okay. Because if if you see this different numbers, then. No, I thought you were referring to the scorecard. Okay. No, no, no. This is the table for the response. We have a total of a thousand full-time uh, workers uh, who have been employed for at least a month, right? Help me if I'm just saying this right. Then 1,205 part-time workers who have been employed for at least a month. Um, and temporary seasonal, we've got 180, right? And that comes to a grand total of 2,544. Right. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Now, of the terminated clients, is this off this grand total? Is this what? Is this reducing the grand total of the terminated clients, or no, is it it's separate? In addition. It's separate. So, of the terminated clients, we had 1,866 clients who lost their jobs. So that they were employed and then lost their jobs. Lost their jobs. And and uh, of the full timers, it was spread over so many months, but a lot of them lost their job after a short duration. And then of the part-time, well, I guess some of this part-time work would have been defined in a way that they would lose their job, right? That's right. Okay. So today, for this, we're spending $18 million. And we have found, how many people, to, how many people at this time this chart was prepared actually still had a job? The 2,544. So they still had a job at that time. Mm -hmm. And then we know that, 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 that 1,866 had a job but lost the job. That's correct. So with 4,410 4, of these TANF participants, and this is TANF participants over 60 months, below 60 months, this is all TANF This is all TANF recipients. And out of a total universe of 18,000? Well, this is of those that are referred, and right. so it's out of the 1,600, I mean 6,232 customers. That referred? Yes, that's, that's correct. Now, how many are wanting to be referred to employment? We have, we have, you mean into it? How many, uh, you've got 6,000 mm -hmm. that have been referred to employment vendors and have gotten, uh, and, and of that, 4,400 have gotten jobs. So we have about 4,900 customers that haven't been assigned a case manager yet. Um, we have a number of customers. 4,900. That's correct. No case manager. That so no progress assigned. whatsoever there. The, none that we can document. Right. So, but you have 6,000 something or other, so a little over 6,000 who have been referred, and of that 6,000, you have 4,400 that have jobs. That's correct. That got jobs, but of that 4,400, almost half of them lost the jobs. Uh, less than half of them. Right. So we end up with a situation where there's 1,079 who have actually gotten a full-time job. And I think that's the name of the game, wouldn't you agree? A full-time job to move you from welfare dependency to self-sufficiency, it starts with having a full-time job. I, I agree. Okay. Yes. So our real product here is 1,079 mm -hmm. out of 6,000, more than 6,000 referred, so that's 
only six of the total number referred. That have found and maintained their employment for the year. No, but who've gotten a full-time job which they held for more than six months. Right. Because there's also the additional 653 that found their jobs but were terminated within that. Right, but month. that didn't work out. That's correct. So those are not success stories. The success story to my mind is the 1,079. Mm -hmm. And for that, how much are we paying in terms of the employment vendors? The vendors receive bonuses um, up for each level of, of success. So they would receive um, somewhere around, I don't know the exact amount, but it, it totals somewhere around $2,000 for that particular client's success over a period of time. They only get paid for the outcome. So, right, the, but you've got the, you've got your your 2015 your 2015 budget. I don't. You have the two. I only have that in front of me. I don't have the 2014. But in 2015, right. you're suggesting I don't know about 13, 14 million for employment right. vendors, and that's before we go to the enhancements. And about 30 percent of that um, budget is actually. Um, if, you know, we either reimburse well, them or the they point. go. Do you think this is a success story? I think it is only a start. We are nowhere near finished. What we need so to I don't think this is success. I think that it's a start. I are think you that happy with all these vendors? Because you know, this committee has had most of the vendors, not all, but most of the vendors have come and testified here, mm -hmm. and, I, and some are very impressive and some are less so. Uh, some had better achievements than others. But I wasn't able to say from my examination in a public hearing that I was happy with all of them. I are you happy with all of them? I think that um, some of the vendors are struggling. Um, they, they are struggling with their management and they're going through uh, management changes. Um, there are some that struggled with documentation. We have a very strict documentation policy. No, but, 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 but I know, Ms. Carroll, but please stay with me just for a moment, please. Mm -hmm. I know you know a lot about this. I, I know you do. Mm -hmm. But if the, if, if, if the proof of the pudding is a full-time job, mm -hmm. a full-time job, so we can then have people exit TANF, right? That's the name of the game, isn't it? To get them off of TANF. If you have 100 to 125 customers exiting TANF each month due to wages, okay, if that's what we're after, and I think that's what it is, then in, that, in the light of that achievement goal, are you happy with what they're producing? I'm. I'm. I'm Are you satisfied that you're getting with working? the progress that they've achieved in the short period of time that we've been evaluating them? And, and the reason why I say that is because what we're seeing is a trend in the direction that we are expecting. When we first started this journey, the length of time that our customers maintained their employment was somewhere between 30 to 60 days. We rarely had customers that had and maintained their employment longer than six months. What we're seeing a trend, though, if you notice in the numbers, we have over almost 2,000 clients, 1,749 clients that gained employment and retained it for six months or more. That's a trend in the right direction. What did you say? I said 1,749. 1,749 customers who obtained employment and maintained it for six months or more. Full time? That's not what this number is. Period. No, that's, that's not what this number says. Um, I see full time 1,079. I don't see 1,700. Unless I'm looking at the wrong place. 1,079. I think we're just saying the same thing. No, you're saying 1,700. 1,749. <laughs> She's counting full time and part time. Right, together. Yeah. No, if you count full time and part time, it goes up to 2,300. She's looking at the six plus months. Call. For six months or more. We had 1,749 customers that have been employed. Oh, but I don't want to count the part-time because I don't think part-time jobs But it's significant you out of because poverty. we're talking about moving a, a, from no employment to some employment to full-time employment. I think that it's a progression. But that it's is like, a progression that occurs. So, so that is what we're looking for and what we're being able to see from the data is mm -hmm. that they're finding jobs and they're keeping them longer. And, and a big area, a big deficit in our former program was in the area of job retention. Mm -hmm. Customers got a job and then they couldn't keep it. They got a lot of good one-day jobs, right. you know, and then they right. lost them. And that is not the, the direction that we wanted the program to be in. So what we're seeing is that clients, we, if they're, even if they're 60-month customers, any customer, we want them to get part-time work. Why? Because it is easier for someone who is working to get a full-time job. 
if you start out with no employment, it is very difficult to break into the well, market. This is very tough stuff. I know of, that. Of course. I know that, but, but so, I, what I say to you is this. This is related to the budget, because in two ways. Number one, the amount of money we're pouring into this mm -hmm. has to be examined. Oh, absolutely. Has to be examined. And for, and for FY15, we're proposing $40 million in clean federal money. $40 million. And you've got to examine that and say, is this working or not working? And I, and and I, I say on the basis of these numbers, is it working? Are people getting some progress? Yes, they are. But is this working the way it should be working? No. We're talking and about what I would ask you to do is to give me a comparison of what we're able to achieve with these vendors with what other jurisdictions are able to achieve with their vendors. Okay. I mean, does this stand up? Is this something, is, is, are we pretty, pretty, pretty good, by comparatively good or not? And the second importance of this is, we're not, we're, with the face of these numbers, we're not willing to cut TANF benefits 41%. We're not. Do you agree or disagree? I think that we have to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to um, enforce the rules and the policies as prescribed by the federal government or not. Well, it's not pres prescribed by the Council of the District of Columbia in the case of TANF. These are federal dollars. We're supposed to enforce, enforce no, the No, but it's also, no, 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 but if we're spending our local money, mm -hmm. and it was, it's a D.C. law and D.C. dollars are at stake here, and it was the D.C. law that is requiring these cuts, but the same council that imposed the cuts can also uh, deny the cuts, and we've done it twice already, I think, at least twice, maybe three times. I just don't, I just, you know, sometimes you approach things, Director Burns, and you say, wow, that's really something. You know, like I remember when my father bought a Pontiac Bonneville, I thought, oh my God, now we're talking. This is, you know, he could never afford the Cadillac that he always wanted. But in Detroit, Michigan, that Pontiac Bonneville for poor immigrant folk was pretty good, gloomy in the driveway. And then you approach other things, you say, oh, oh. And I, I don't have a negative reaction to this, but it doesn't enthuse me to think that we're really succeeding. So and that's what I want if, and, and this becomes part of my argument that we ought not to cut 41% out of TANF for people there over 60 months. And that there's still uh, uh, 11,000 children under the age of 13 that are the victims. And uh, you know, I, just, I don't see us making such a progression. And we still don't, we still have the problem of no shows. It's still 50 to 60 percent. Do we have any analysis of how that may have improved since this committee raised the issue last September? So we have. Um, These are people who are not in touch at all. We have uh, 2,136 customers that were assigned to the work readiness program where they have not shown up despite the fact that they've had their. How many is it? 2,136. And that's out of the, what's the universe there, please? Um, the work readiness covers customers is about 60% of our population. So what's the number of? Out of 18,000? Is that what we're looking no, at? No, it's, it's, it's closer to, the, the universe is the 6,232. Oh, so, oh, I and see. So the 6,232. And then of those, how many are no shows? Work readiness. 2,136. So that looks like about a third. Mm -hmm. And so... Am I right? So we've got a third of the people who don't want to show up. And so for those customers, you know, we're, we're enforcing the sanction policy. Oh, so the sanction policy is being enforced now? We are getting, yes. We had to start. When did you start? Um, I think we actually got in full, in full swing about two months ago. Two months ago. So people are being sanctioned? They are being sanctioned. Okay. And you think that's going to help? We think that as we progress to the second level of sanction, we'll get more uh, Okay, I'd response. like to be kept informed of that, please, yeah, because you know I have those doubts also. But so, but the, well, the, what I want the public to, to, to keep in mind here is that we've got 6,232 people referred to employment vendors, am I right? Mm -hmm. And 2,100 of those, one third, one third, maybe one third, don't show up. Mm -hmm. Don't show up. So we know that in the case of one third of these TANF recipients, some are over 60 months, some under 60 months. They, they can't be bothered for whatever reason. And what brought this uh, issue to your attention, not that you hadn't probably realized it, I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting that, but the public uh, recognition of it was last September in this committee. Right. And what analysis has occurred since then? Well, we know that um, 688 of them are 60-month customers. 
Um, so we, we do know that. We have, we're so only so we're the 2136, so most of them aren't. They are, most of them are not 60 month customers. That's interesting. Quite honestly, I was a little surprised by that. Mm -hmm. um, it is actually those that are under 60 months that are a victim of that. And, and w there could be a number of reasons for this. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, every time a person is referred to for mm -hmm. a sanction, we do send out the home visitors. So as they're going through the process, we'll definitely be able to learn more. Um, but only a small percentage of them, comparatively, are 60-month customers. Well, that's interesting, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, uh, you know, we, we can think of all manner of reasons, uh, and you would know them all, Director Burns, and so would you, Director, Deputy Director mm -hmm. Carroll. You would know all the reasons that people might not be showing up. Substance abuse, inertia, etc. Child care. Child care. Uh, uh, domestic violence. Domestic uh, violence. Mental health, including General depression. Yeah. You know, uh, but until I mention, I just say that when we have these alarmingly high numbers, mm -hmm. until we're able to figure out some way to reach them, that also suggests that the program is not succeeding. Well, because you you had, had one thousand jobs, mm -hmm. you know, but but in fact, there's a whole a third of these folks that don't even make it. Now, let me ask you this question, M Mr. Barry asked it earlier, and I wanted to ask it too. What kind of salaries are we talking about here for the full time? TANF, full-time employment for TANF recipients, what are they making? I, a majority of them are making between the minimum wage and $10 an hour. Well, the minimum wage in the District of Columbia is a 775, I remember? 785? 785, and so $10, you're saying the majority are making between that, so that would be about eight fifty an hour, mm -hmm. and eight fifty an hour does not really move you much out of poverty. A client based with with the generous disregards that we have in um, our TANF program, it, mm -hmm. you can probably earn um, as much as seven hundred seventeen fifty. Um, yeah, but that's what it takes to get to exit TANF right. due to Order income to according exit. to your responses. Seventeen. Well, but that's still, that still puts them, though, somewhere around 110% or so of poverty. Right. But if somebody's making $400 a week, which would be the $10 full time, then they would be under that. And, and we, uh, we would disregard a good percentage of that income on a weekly basis. Well, of why, the $400. Why would you do that? Well, and that's the way the that's how the system is set up. It's not it, it the we we disregard we give them a, an employment incentive of $160 a month right. and then we deduct any child care expenses out of pocket that uh -huh. a customer has and then we reduce uh, their um, income by two thirds and it's only the net that we count so the TANF grant so the customer actually stays on TANF a little bit longer um, they don't just you know fall off mm -hmm. the so the 1750 per month is really a discounted that's right. number. It's actually much higher. Mm -hmm. and that's, is that what you're saying? Just yes. so I understand. No, I, well, no? that's the maximum, I think. If they're making over that, then after the disregards, right. it's enough that's counted so that they don't get any TANF benefits. Right. What are the total number of families on TANF in the District of Columbia? Is it 18,000? I keep saying No, we're, we're a little over 17,000 right now. 17,100. Okay, seventeen thousand one hundred, not eighteen thousand. Not okay. anymore. Okay, good, good for you. And I'm telling you, this is an interesting question response that I got from you all, which is that you say a hundred to one hundred twenty-five customers exit TANF each month due to wages, but how many of those were in the, not in the general TANF program, but in the TEP program, in the special so program? We're not able to tell you that right now. That well, what do you think? Do you got people here? You got you brought part of your staff here. So well, what's what's the, the 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 anecdotal impression? Is it a lot? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think it is either. I, I, I so in other words, you see, that's another indicator, is it not? Tell me if I'm wrong. That this is not working the way it should be. The reason why we can't necessarily measure it against the employment vendors is because when a customer has been employed for six months or more, they come out of their caseload. And that's when we have we have a, re, a, a retention unit mm -hmm. that works with those customers if they choose to. They're not required if they, to. If they get a job of sufficient, most times they want to cut us loose as quickly as possible. 
Pardon me? Most, in most cases, clients want to cut us loose as quickly as possible. I'm sure. So how many are there? They to fit that category. Well, I mean, it's increased, but it's, it's you know, customers sometimes will find jobs on their own. I know, but um, it's true. Cool. It, it, I'm trying, forgive me, but I'm trying to figure out if spending... If spending eighteen million dollars is making how much of a difference it's making. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to figure out. And I know you want to tell you want me to be happy because this program has been in place for eighteen months, two years. Well, we, it took twenty five years to get to this I, point. I know. So you're not going to get out of it overnight. I know. I know. <laughs> but you know, please understand what I'm trying to say is, you you were spending eighteen million dollars on FY fourteen, mm -hmm. give or take, and you want to move it to forty million. And FY15, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what about some of this money to, to avoid the cut? What if I take from these vendors? So, you know, what if I take from these vendors six million dollars? So if you do that, then you I won't be able to saying? serve everyone. What? That's what's going to happen. What? The 4,900 customers that need case management services in order for them to get jobs, I will not be able to assign them whether it be to a contract vendor or to one of my employees, they will not be able to get services. Why is that? Because the goal is to expand our capacity, not to contract it. But, if you're, but, but by expanding the capacity, if you're not getting the result, if you're not getting the result that you want, then I you can have more people, you can have more people working at McDonald's, yes. Or you can have more people getting uh, part-time jobs, yes. Mm -hmm. But I think that those people who are facing a 41% tariff cut on October the 1st would say, well, take some of this. You can have, we'll still be leaving, you know, uh, a $5 million increase in town of vendors. And if we took for just six months, we'd be leaving a $7 million town of vendor increase. Mm -hmm. Why not work with that for a while? You follow me on this way, I do follow you. Because, because I don't see a smashing success spending $18 million. Well, I think that we were spending, prior to our redesign, we were spending upwards of around 13 to $14 million, and mm. we were only serving 3,900 customers at any given time. What, do you get, what is the difference between job placement vendors and work readiness vendors? So the work readiness customer, um, vendors serve the customers with higher barriers to employment. So it's going to take them longer. Mm. They're required to provide them case management services and to help them remove the barriers to employment and then either get them or help them get uh, work experience or job training or a combination of education, any combination that the customer needs in order for them to gain employment. The job placement vendors are for customers that have very good work histories and lower barriers to employment. So the expectation is that they should have a less difficult time getting customers employed. Because well, all, of these, these all of these vendors, actually in most cases it's, it's vendors have both, you know, programs. There are a few that have right, both. But all of them are involved, uh, very few. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Grant Associates has only work readiness. And OICDC, what does that stand for? The Opportunities Industrialization. Oh, yes. They have only uh, work readiness, but all of the others have both. Mm -hmm. So all of this money is really going toward getting people jobs, That's one way or another. Okay. Well, I, I, I think I made my point. You tell us that, uh, that there's a decrease in cash assistance of $5 million for TANF. What does that mean? That's as a result of the 41.7 percent reduction. Oh, so this is the, because we were trying to find where the savings was. That's it. Yeah. So you think this is the savings of five million dollars? Yes. Well, why would it cost us six million dollars to, to delay it for the full year if it's only five million dollars in savings? Um, that's the cumulative number. You have negatives and positives, so it's not all due to. Uh -huh. Um, it could be due to reduction in on the federal side also. We loaded more, but oh, it's, it's about six. What we did, we reinvested it in um, fixed costs. We paid some salary yeah. costs, and we moved the remainder of it to the jobs line. So, uh, but this is the savings. Yes, five, that's the savings. Five million dollars. And where are we putting that savings? It went to cover increasing fixed costs. It went to cover um, cost of living increases. Increasing fixed. Fix, costs. The, the fixed cost assessment. Rent? The fixed cost assessment for 15 increased, so we used some of those savings. What does that mean? That the rent might have gone up. DGS gave us an increased assessment. So we so have to be cutting tariff forms. No, 
to pay the rent to DGS mm, for the DHS? The funding there, well, well, the funding there was one time. So in actuality, I need to well, correct that. Come with me, come with me, stay with me, stay with me. Why don't we spend on five million dollars of receiving from the backs of ten of these ch eleven thousand children under the age of thirteen? Why are we putting that money? No, we actually had two things happen there. We had one-time funding to increase the payment to tariff customers. That was not put into the baseline. One time. One-time funding. The funding you put in last year was just one to four. The mayor put money to restore the tariff cuts last year. The council put funding to restore. Well, we the had that funded. We had it funded. It was just one-time funding. But it was delayed, and so we paid for it. We yeah, so we didn't put it into the base next time, or it didn't. It was not put into. Well, the how much base. is that? That was um. How much did we got? Four point four point eight million dollars something. Oh, like so we got only got four hundred thousand for your rent. And the other piece of it, I'll tell you what else it is. Well, I'm looking at that, I'll just tell everybody that of the, of the people who are going to be affected by these cuts, 2,500 of them are below the age of three, 6,200 of them are between the ages of four and nine, and 3,000 Slightly over 3,000 are between the ages of 10 and 13. This, this is who's paying for whatever this is about, which so, I, I still don't understand what it's about. What happened is we, we never, the funding that was put in for the one-time payment was never put back into the baseline. We restored the, you restored the TANF payment last year, but it was put in the budget book as one-time funding. So it would not be in the base in 2015. So when we got our target, those funds were never in the base. Well, it was a but but we really went forward with the further cuts, though. This was only a one-time delay. That was so why do we have to pay for the one-time delay? The, the one, no, well, what happened is the one-time delay was put back in, and then now there is a 41% cut moving forward. So what happened is we reinvested that into the jobs line. No, wait, 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 wait. When we delayed the cut, you put in... Well, I repaid for that delay at the for one For one year. Right. So it was not in the 15 target. So there's a negative of whatever you gave us. We didn't, we didn't have that well, money. Well, money. But you gave us for one year. It says, right. well, when you look, it says one-time yeah. funding, non-recurring. I'll tell you what, give me a paragraph on this okay. so I can understand. It says non-recurring. And then what happened? There was a 41% reduction that begins on October 1st. Those funds were taken and reinvested in other areas within the agency. And what, what was that? Um, we used... That's the five million well, dollars. We moved it to jobs. Huh? We moved it to jobs. Well, give me a breakdown of how you're spending $5.02 million in cash and assistance tariff decrease. Give me a breakdown of where that money is going. The... This is question number eight. Question number eight. I think we answered that question. It's a good technique, by the way, giving us very, very small print. Mm -hmm. you for it. But you're not going to do work with me because I've got magnifying glasses when I need them. I've got a whole page that can magnify the whole page. And when you do, your print, print is getting smaller and smaller. I'm not suggesting anything about this, but I mean, you know, I don't think a 10-year-old could read that easily. Can you read that? Okay. <laughs> the reduction of the 5.8, it was a one-time reduction to the later TANF cuts over 60 months. That was not in the B, so that's a negative. We never had those funds in. But we did, okay, you, please provide me, okay. if you would, sir. Yeah. with an explanation of this, and then I'll, yeah. I'll read it very closely. I'll, okay. uh, first thing in some morning, I'll read it so I can... Okay. Uh, first thing in the morning, I'll read it so I'm okay. fresh and alert yeah. and can understand all that. Because okay. uh, I, I remember distinctly having fully compensated the budget for the delay, but... 
you know, uh, this is a new thought to me. But it will also tell me how you're spending the cash savings, for, I mean, the savings from the cash assistance decrease of $5 million. It was moved to the jobs, we invested in the jobs line. Well, this is, you've answered this question three different ways. This is the third different answer. No, we moved, that specific one, we moved to the job line. We no, we've asked you that question two times previously, and you've had a different answer. No, we moved well, the Well, tell, tell me in writing what the 5.02 is going to. The 5.02. No, tell me in writing, Mr. Uh -huh. Bernard. Okay, in, I can In writing. Okay, and hopefully I by tomorrow. Yeah, yeah actually, I sent it to you already. You should have it, but I'll, I'll simplify it and send one? it again. Yes. It's oh, I was talking about the tiny, tiny one. Yes, it's the tiny one, yeah. See, I don't have the magnifying glass here with me. Cash assistance tariff is reduced by five, five million twenty-one thousand. But I don't think this says where it went. It says that... No, it was re we never got it. It didn't go anywhere. When we got the target from... No, 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 I mean, in the future... Wait, 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 wait. Now you've got me thoroughly confused. We're told that, that by cutting tariff benefits by 41% on mm -hmm. October the 1st, there's going to be a budget savings of 5.02 million. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. Okay, then my question is, since you have a budget savings going forward after we make that cut mm -hmm. of $5 million. Yeah, but I, I think... Why is the $5 million? But I think I now understand your question, because oh, I'm, you're asking a different question from what I'm answering, actually. Oh, because what, I, I what happened is you restored... We had a 25% cut, you restored it in 14, and we did not get that in 15. And then there is a 41% beginning October 1st moving forward. That's the money you're asking about. Yes. That money was reinvested into the jobs line. You took all of this $5 million and you put it where? We put it into the into jobs the line. Vendor program? Into the vendor program. Oh, so that so says I'm going to take it out of the vendor program. That makes perfect sense, right? You put it on, we can take it out, right? That's your decision as well. Yes, the council. Well, we lost the majority of this Sorry. council, but I get to take the first cut of it. Did you understand that? So we took the $5 million savings from the 41% cut, put it into the vendor program. We can take it back out of the vendor program and delay the cut. Most of it. If you choose. If we choose. If you choose. If it, yeah. just, I'm just trying to understand things. Because, you know, this is uh, not always easy to understand. So I have uh, with one of the last shows, uh, now the power program is an interesting program because this is people that we determine, that the council has determined, should not be subject to cuts, even though they've been on tenor for 60 months. And so in this category we find victims of domestic violence, which we added last year. And there's a, there's a group of people in this regard. Uh, I wanted to have uh, mothers with babies. But uh, the council decided, no, they didn't want to do that. And they wanted to have uh, TANF recipients who were going to school in some form of accredited educational program. And lo and behold, after we passed the budget, DHS came back to us and said, no, there's not enough sufficient money to support that power exemption. Question one, how, did we, uh, how much short of the spending authorization were you in the other power categories? In other words, was there an excess amount of money, excess, that we didn't spend in the other power categories year to date? I'd have to provide you with that analysis. I don't have that on the I think you'll find that there is. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, then, is question number two, why hasn't that money been applied to fund what the council authorized? I don't particularly agree with it. I have another preference. Mm -hmm. But still, the council voted for this. Chairman Mendelson was very interested in this. Since we were on the low budget in other categories, and I think we have the numbers on this actually, for example, there's a, in domestic violence, it's half of what we estimated it would be. And uh, so, why don't you, why are we coming forward with a BSA amendment to abolish that power exemption, which of course I don't agree with? Why don't you simply apply that money that we have? in savings to that exemption category. So there were a number of issues beyond just the actual funding of the cash assistance that were the subject of the hearing regarding that particular power exemption. Um, that included the issue around counting their work participation and pulling, essentially pulling the TANF successes. Many of the customers that you see that are actively engaged with the work vendor um, would have been um, pulled out of their caseload and assigned to our program 
that they would not have otherwise been able to um, engage with the vendors. That was one issue. Second issue was access to child care and many of the other programs and services that they currently receive as part of the safety net in the TANF employment program that they cannot receive currently under the power program that was not factored into the original estimates. And then the third was the impact on the work participation rate. Because the power program is not counted in our work participation program, you're essentially pulling out the most successful customers out of that base which means we would have to essentially find an equal number of failures and we wouldn't be able to report those successes to the federal government for purposes of our federal funding. And that's just a summary of some of the issues around that particular <coughs> provision that we found after we did the analysis that would have been much more problematic and significantly more costly than just purely paying the cash assistance to those benefits, you know, restoring the, the benefit amounts to those customers in the program. And I recall that none of that was told to us when we were passing it. We didn't have time to think about it okay. at that time. Well, we have, uh, we have some numbers on the power town of caseload measurements, and it would suggest that we are uh, quite a lot below uh, what, what we had anticipated. And so I, can you give us a number, please, on the amount of money that is likely not to be spent on the power exemptions? We can provide you with that analysis. I know we have currently about Well, just a number is fine. Just we're, not going to, we're likely not to spend the following amount that was appropriate for this. Provide purpose. that to you tomorrow. Can you get that? That should be easy, shouldn't it? Can we have the exact question the way you're answering it, uh, asking it, though, so that we oh, for oh. sure? Well, if we're not clear on what the question is, we might not be able to meet. Well, think of the power exemptions in FY14. Okay. And so the amount of money that was appropriate to cover those power exemptions and look at how much we're actually spending year to date and see if we're likely to run a, 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 an underspending situation. So I, I only caution because we have about 1,000 customers, maybe a little less than that, that have requests for power pending. Um, well, and so once those applications are approved, there's a high likelihood that those customers will That's fair. That's a fair mm -hmm. point. That's a fair point. And please factor that in. We will. Because I don't want to do anything goofy here, but I just want to see if there's money that could be applied. Mm -hmm. It looks on its face that there might be. Uh, now, rather than abolishing the exemption for people in school from avoiding, from selling them from these cuts, why not fund it? How much would it cost to fund it? Oh, I'd, all told. I'd have to pull all, the all analysis out what, that we provided the last time. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, I think that there are some states that have education programs within mm -hmm. their TANF program. And if that's something that you're looking for, that you could talk with the mayor, and that's something we can talk about for FY15. Uh, no, I just want to know. Here's, here's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. because. I'd like you, and, and you know, if anything, if, if nothing else, I'm persistent. And I'm so concerned about the, mom, the mothers with babies mm -hmm. under the age of 12. And I said last year that we threw them off the lifeboat, and we did. We did, because we made them subject to the, they're going to be subject to the 41% cut. And you remember the numbers on this, I think you do. Oh, you there are, are 3,000 children under the age of three. I don't know how many children will be under the age of one. But those kids uh, will be subject to cuts. I would have had them not subject to cuts. So but the majority of the council said no for various reasons, and I'm not criticizing a the majority. They said we want the education instead. Now what I'd like to see is how much would it cost with all of what we know now for the education power exemption, and how much would it cost for the babies with children under 12 months, for the mothers with children under 12 months. Because I'm, I'm willing to take another run at this. I don't know why we would cut TANF benefits by 41% for a person who had a baby that was six months old. I just, I, I mean, I, I, I can't fathom why we would do that. But now and I would have an additional argument that maybe this is less expensive than the educational power exemption. Could you help me with that, please, and give me some numbers? Because, you know, all those numbers came from you the last time. Yeah, not from you personally, but from the agency. Um, Well, so to, me, to, to sum up on TANF, I'd like to see if we could restore the, babies, uh, the mothers with babies with children under one year. 
as a power exemption. And I'd like to see if we couldn't, uh, that's a certain that we can't do the education because it's so much more expensive. Uh, and I'd like to delay the 41% cut for 10 of recipients who have been on the program for more than 60 months because I'm interested in avoiding another uh, a winter homeless family crisis. And it's got to contribute to that. Um, I think that's about all I have. You, I, I said we would cover, I do want to say something about substance abuse because that's one of the bright spots of the budget. Uh, in response to my advocacy, I think, in part in a way, the mayor has increased that budget, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um. And I'm pleased to also the IDA. You know, interim disability assistance, as you pointed out, Director Burns, is critically important to people who have nothing. It's about $180 a month uh, while people are awaiting the outcome of their um, Medicaid uh, uh, appeals. Uh -huh. Can you tell us what's happened with substance abuse? So with the Because that everybody would agree that that's a major impediment to full-time successful employment. With the appropriation provided in FY14, we have partnered with the Department of Behavioral Health in a grant that they received with the federal, from the federal government called 12 Cities. Um, that program combines mental health, substance abuse, and HIV AIDS um, prevention and treatment for um, mm -hmm. you know residents in the District of Columbia. What we've done is added some of the resources from um, the appropriation to that grant to provide wraparound services to customers that we've identified that have mental health and or substance abuse issues or a combination of those issues. Um, that grant has now been awarded um, and is fully functional uh, within the Department of Behavioral Health. Mm -hmm. um, we are adding two, uh, mm -hmm. two staff resources at each of our uh, TANF um, um, resource centers, one at the Virginia, two at the Virginia Williams Resource Center and two within uh, at 2100 Martin Luther King Avenue, right. who are mental health providers, or mental health uh, professionals rather, who will, um, after we've completed an assessment, they would actually be able to do a direct referral uh, to these providers, as well as any Medicaid covered provider for um, mm -hmm. treatment and, and services. Um, so essentially what we've been able to do is streamline and um, leverage the federal dollars that um, is somewhat ambiguous because they're provided mm -hmm. through the um, the managed care organizations mm -hmm. that our TANF recipients are part of. Mm -hmm. And then we've been able to get these specialized expertise of um, um, uh, providers that are skilled in both mental health, substance abuse, and HIV AIDS treatment mm -hmm. and prevention. So um, the goal being, of course, that we provide a very good integrated service model for these families. Right. And so that's our goal, and, and right. I'm really excited about right. this initiative. So am I. And I think it's fair to say that this $2 million is leveraging, and we don't have the, uh, the exact figures here because it's not in our budget, but it's leveraging uh, both money from this grant as well as the actual treatment dollars that are in Medicaid, which come in at 70% uh, federal dollars. That's exactly right. So in many ways, this is uh, uh, a multiplier effect of $2 million uh, is getting a lot more than $2 million of uh, additional substance abuse treatment. Right. Uh, well, this is, a, you know, I'm finding that in all of the agencies within the purview of this committee, uh, major strides are being made in terms of substance abuse intervention and treatment. DYRS, Highmark's there. Of course, uh, uh, CFSA has done a fine job. DDS even is, 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 is stepping up to the plate. And so it's a very different scheme of response than, than what I had when I came became chairman of the committee. I'm, I can't tell you how much I'm, that pleases me and how much I think that's real progress. And so. Your advocacy has been absolutely essential, and I know sometimes you may be perceived as a broken record, uh, but yeah. it, it's just absolutely necessary yeah. to come through that yeah. way and to, uh, as a person in recovery myself, Oh. I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I will say that uh, this is also near and dear to my... Uh, I didn't know that. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we're of the same mind. Okay. And we know how important this is. We know how important this is. 
Uh, I do have that. This is, I think I'm done. Are, are you any more? Where's all this? I don't know. I think maybe this is the next set of questions coming in. Oh, oh we don't have the fiscal impacts. For the original power. Right. Uh, who, who is this for? What? Well, this is what we had last year. Oh, I see. I, but that's for the school. Yeah, that's what but we don't have for the babies. Like yeah, it's, it's much less money was projected for the babies. So it, it kind of leaves me wondering why, why we should have done the babies. But we were all cuts last year anyway, so we, we, you know, we're looking forward to the future. But here's the, number, here's, the, here's the numbers I have now, going back to the power exemptions. In the population estimates made for the power expansion, there were a total of 274 TANF recipients that your agency believed would qualify for, for exemptions. According to agency performance oversight responses, as of January 2014, there were only 134 total recipients. For which, I'm sorry, which one? For, this is for all the exemptions. For all the exemptions, the exemptions. And so this was, this is admittedly in January, so, mm -hmm. you know, that's just a portion of the, of the fiscal year. But mm -hmm. let's, when you check on this. I can give you those numbers now. Okay. So I do know that we have a hundred. The total number for the new power for exemptions. For the new categories, we have 199 currently. So we're And power. we have an increase in our medical. We're at 455. Okay, but none of these are for the for the education, obviously, because That's you, correct. you haven't issued that. That's correct. Okay, all right. I think we're doing a heck of a job. I, well, the enormous challenges, one hundred percent. And I, I know I've been kind of hard hitting back and forth here, but uh, I, I don't think for a moment that you're not really performing top notch, top notch, and. Uh, you're a credit to the, the city and you're a credit to the mayor. And, but I really wish that we could look closely, and we want really to look closely at this D.C. general business because the final analysis we're going to need new facilities with your approach, new facilities with my approach, and the difference is I think we'll have a much greater savings if we shut the facility down. And also we'll be saying to the public, this didn't work. And nobody knows that better than Director David Burns who has said very, very candidly what this is all about when he called the, the building dead and now you said no amount of rehabilitation could make this suitable for families. And yet the, the proposal before me would have as many as 100 families there or more in 2015. So that's my last. Uh, and, and, and if I could just say that uh, I have been pleased and honored and still pleased and honored to be working with you on these oh. things. We haven't always been of the same mind, uh, but uh, I think we've always been of the same heart. Yes. And uh, so yes. Uh, uh, I, I just really have and do appreciate this, uh, uh, this partnership that we've developed and uh, want to make sure that we're doing and that the, any legacy that I leave behind is at least setting us in the right direction and uh, uh, and uh, improving the lives of those that we all mutually serve. Right. And I don't think there's any question about that. And that applies to you and your entire team of people who are working on this. And I think things are vastly different than before when we when you arrived today. And you know when we get into all the we dive into this forest and we're. Looking at all these little individual trees, you know, I don't want to forget the bigger picture, and that's what it is. So, congratulations, but please let's shut this thing down, and and yeah. have have quality housing as its replacement, exactly. and that's the key. It's not, not not turning our backs on families that are in desperate need. We're saying we're going to give you something better than putting your family of five, six, whatever, in a hospital room. We can do better than that, but we can't even guarantee hot water on every single day. So, uh, there will be no further, do we have a closing statement somewhere? It's in the binder. And let me also say how much I appreciate Yolanda Barlow, because she has, she has done a phenomenal job. Nothing that I, where is it? I know I'm complimenting you and I can't find it. But nothing of what we've been able to do here could have been done without this lady sitting next to me. Yolanda, you should take a bow.
is long. You know, the number of ex extra hours, or, you know, it's, it's something that's you know, putting all this together is, you know, you're, you're first class, Yolanda. And she doesn't like to be complimented, but. Uh, do we have a, do we say when the next heat meeting is, or? Or the next is the markup. So I'd like to thank Director Burns and his staff and all of the testimony that was provided today. A very compelling testimony by youth, I thought, uh, in the earlier hearing, which was part of today. And then the eleven witnesses that were at our hearing on April the 30th, all those people who have given so much. The advocacy community is absolutely critical to my mind to whatever success we're having in this city. And I've said that over and over again, but the nonprofit providers with all of their volunteer and, and, and all of their energy and expertise, there's no substitute. I congratulate you and thank you. So the bottom line for the business before the committee, this uh, continued on the previously recessed hearing on the mayor's proposed FY 2015 budget for the Department of Human Services is adjourned at a quarter to seven on May 7, 2014, with my thanks. Thank you.